Good evening, everybody. Welcome to League of Extraordinary Inventors. I'm your host, Mike from Faraday Research. It is August 16th, 2024. Welcome to the show. It's Friday night, Free Energy Friday. And uh, we got a regular panel on tonight. We got Nathan, and we have a uh, um, benefactor with us. We also have Noel, or we call her Lulu. And uh, we have uh, Mike from Florida. Welcome to the show. Hi. How's everybody doing? How you doing? Good. Hi. Excellent. Excellent. Everybody had a good, good to week. be here, Mike. Yep. Well, it's Friday night. Of course, it's good to be here. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Right? It's the you favorite. Know, it's my favorite right. day of the week. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Happy, fr happy Friday, free energy Friday, whatever you want to call it. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Nice. Um, ho hopefully, uh, we'll get Philip on. Maybe he's just running a little bit late, so we got one more spot for one more person to join us. Uh, don't forget, everybody, our live chat is open, and uh, if you want to join the live chat, ask any questions for our inventors, you can do so, and I'll post the uh, comments on the website or actually on the live stream. So let's get to it. Uh, who wants to start? Wants to be the lucky first person to start. <laughs> They're saying today is a special day in the solar world. Somehow the, the there's cosmic energy that's coming from the sun that's supposed to shift us from one dimension to the other. But I don't know how. Yeah, to yeah there was a yeah. Come to mention it. Uh, day before yesterday, there was a big X flare, and it hit the southern hemisphere. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, radio blackouts, uh, like shortwave and stuff like that. Um, I believe Southeast Asia uh, was affected. Philippines was affected. All that region, South China Sea area, that was affected by the uh, uh, solar storm. And uh, there was aurora going on, too. So if you lived up north, you were able to see a bit of a light show going on. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Well, there was one back... Yeah, it was what March, April. We had that huge, you know, outburst of, from the sun. It was like two or three X flares within a 24-hour period. We yeah. saw the aurora Brahma. up here really, really good. It's called CMH external mass ejection. Yeah, the, yeah, right. And what and what does that entail? Uh, uh, it destroys satellites. It destroys telecommunications. It uh, could like literally, you know. So rise. yeah, it's like. It, from what I understand, it's uh, charged particles that actually get ejected from the sun. Yeah. That so today? that's what, uh, day before yesterday. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Day before yesterday, we had uh, X flare, but it, it affected the southern hemisphere. So we were kind of lucky. Hmm. Uh, it happened, I think it was 2 a.m. in the morning. So yeah, I was sleeping. <laughs> Yeah, I think we were lucky. Everything, like most of the devices, uh, were, were not in operation. So a lot of people might have not gotten as affected as if it was during the daytime. Yeah, I think uh, the communications, like shortwave and uh, radio communications, of first say like the Navy and mm -hmm. stuff like that, probably probably was affected. There was some probably uh, radio blackouts with that. So yeah, that's probably highly possible that that's what was going on. So, uh, Nathan, what have you been up to this week? Well, I, I broke my Tesla coil last week, so I, I dropped oh, right. it. Oh, right. And oh, it no. Got, it got cut, like, at the bottom, just, like, uh, killed the wire. So, it's about this far from the bottom, right? So, yeah. I just cut it out a little bit and put it on a switch. So, it's now on a toggle. So, now, mm -hmm. either I can use all of it. Or I can cut that portion out. So what that does is allow me to go from perfect resonance to not resonating. And then wow. back. So I can flip back and forth with the toggle in order to do it. It works perfect for my gravity flyer now. Wow. So toggle a toggle mean what variable resistor you're using? Like uh well, it's a switch. It's just a switch. It just it just gives you the yeah, it goes from you know full power, so two poles and then the extra one. So that you can get over to the other side. Yeah. So, how about if you, you know, if you used a variable resistor instead of a toggle, 
do you think you would be able to correct that fine tune of the resonant frequency at, at that part of the uh, coil? Well, I, I don't need to correct it. See, one side, when you connect it one way, it connects uh -huh. all the wire. So that gives you perfect resonance, right? But okay. when I, I turn the switch, it gives me out of resonance. So now I get feedback in my coil. So it heats uh -huh. the number one coil, but then it shoots an energy burst as soon as I turn it back to oscillation. So mm -hmm. I get a massive energy burst out of it, which is perfect. It was exactly what I wanted. It was the luckiest accident ever. So Really? Eh? Hmm. Yeah. It was it, I Wait, was trying to figure out how to do it, you know what I mean? And and it just it happened on accident. What it fell off the table or something? Yeah, I was trying to show somebody the ultrasound box when I was talking to them for our guest last week, and it just fell off the table. So <laughs> nothing I could do about it, it just fell and the board hit it, boom, dead on. And once you <laughs> mess with that wire, it's just gonna spray. So it was either rewind a whole new one. Or just see if you could play with it a little bit. You know, what I mean, make something out of it. And yeah, I got I got a question for you on your construction. When you wind the coil, do you spray like a glue or an adhesive on it to keep the windings from separating? How do you uh, do that? Well, as soon as I'm done, I spray it with a uh, spray lacquer. Oh, okay. And, and, and then it it sticks everything to the PVC pipe, so it'll go in between the the wire. I mean, even right. though it's so tight, it'll still get in there and stick to the thing. So it'll stay, and then you can put uh, another coating on it if you want. Listen up, everybody. That's a tip when you're building Tesla coils. Yeah, you don't you don't have to put it on first. You don't want it sticky while you're doing it. You just want yeah. it tight as you're winding it. The tighter yeah. it is, the better. I have to wear these little tiny glasses, my wife's reading glasses, just right. just in order to see the, the, the wire where it comes in because yeah. you have to be – like just mm -hmm. off by an angle like this when it comes right. in, so it will sit sit in there perfect every time. Right. So and yeah. with the smaller the wire it is, the harder it is. The bigger the wire, oh cakewalk. Yeah. So yeah, usually I made mine if I did make Tesla clothes would be anywhere from a twenty four to a twenty six gauge. That's usually the size oh. uh, what I used. I didn't go up to say like a thirty or thirty two or a thirty six gauge. That's too crazy. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's too I used 28 on the gravity flyer, and then the gold one behind me and the red one behind me are both 32. Both 32. So, yeah, you have more patience than I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tried uh, 34, and it was just like fine hair. It was no good. Yeah. And it, and it breaks easy, too, right? That's yeah, that, that was the problem. I broke it three times. Yeah, yeah. That's discouraging when you, you're like almost done and the friggin' wire breaks. It's like, and there's oh, man. nothing you can do about it because you already calculated the resonance frequency before you built it and knew exactly how long it had to be. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, that's that's hard. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. I've done that a couple of times where I'm wrapping it and, then it, and it breaks. Yeah. Oh, it was a good man. idea with the switch, Nathan. Yeah. Yeah, like... So, it works, yeah. Huh? I've made a few Tesla coils, and I, I use those little uh, uh, ion generators that you can pick up on Amazon for like I think they're like less than twenty bucks, and they put out eleven kVA, not much current, but they put a high voltage out, and I was able to jump sparks about three to four inches long. Yeah, like so. And it's loud too because I was using basically a spark gap to do it so the thing's loud as all hell right that's crazy uh, yeah. Sean just chatted in he's researching a rectangle wire for his next Tesla coil That'll be yeah Tesla did Tesla did uh, pyramid shaped te uh, Tesla coils oh wow hmm. yeah if you watch the uh, energy from the vacuum series is what Nathan's been posting there's mm -hmm. one where he's talking about John Serjanka this John Sudeikis? Just, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, he had some coils that were shaped like pyramids huh. and conical, like like two pyramids facing each other, and they join at the point out. Uh -huh. And they were apparently uh, coils that Tesla was working on. Never made it into the books, but this guy had it. 
And John Pantini, when he saw those, he's like, ooh, i like to make that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, did you see the Tesla coil he was working on, Mike? I've seen an original, uh, original built Tesla coil by Tesla. It was at the uh, observatory right on the mountain where Hollywood, you know, where the Hollywood sign is. There is an observatory going up the mountain. Okay. Uh, halfway up. Uh, I forget the name of the observatory. I think it's the observatory of California. If you okay. go in there, they, they have an original Tesla coil. And when I was there, they were running it. Wow. It was the freak, freakiest thing i ever seen in my life. Nine foot lightning bolts coming out of this thing. <laughs> it, was in, wow. it was in a Faraday cage. It was in a Faraday cage. I just caught the very end of the demonstration, but I'm just like, oh my God. <laughs> I don't believe it. So after the demonstration, I went up to the window because it was behind glass because, you know, this thing's shooting out, you know, four billion kilovolts, you know, bolts of lightning coming out of the thing, right? You have to isolate that area. It was in a Faraday cage as well. And I walked up and it had said it was original. It had a plaque on it that said originally designed by Nikola Tesla himself. Nice. Well, I was yeah. talking about Sean's call for our Monday show. Did you see that one? Which one? Sean's coil for the Monday show? I yeah, I think so. It's in it's I, I I put it up for you to share it for the screen share. Yeah, maybe put it in the share and then we can take a quick look at it. Yeah, the Death Star coil was amazing. Hey Nathan, is your no, mic hit, part I'll of the play real quick? Oh, wrong one. Here you go. You're about oh, to no. see some, it could be. Do the Tesla coils ionize the air around it? Yes, they do. Of course. Oh, yeah. Big time. It's round. Nice. I like that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. yeah, he does all kinds of different coils in there, man. I'll, I'll show you real quick if I can. <laughs> hey, Paul from Toronto. Fellow Torontonian. Welcome to the show. That's Open cool. Lines. I'm waiting for those Not sharks sure. to teleport a cup or something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they got to do something eventually. I mean, they're just, yeah. now it's just a, just a show. I mean, it's like, wow, that's cool. That's all, but what is it doing, you know? <laughs> It almost looks like a like like a cannonball with a fuse in it. You know what I mean? We got to find a purpose for these high voltage uh, trans. Oh yeah, arc. application. Yeah, an application for them, like a, a real. Well, world. see, he puts sparks out of them, but he doesn't have to. They'll they'll just put uh, energy out if you change the DC. He's got AC going through it now. Oh. And he's got this little mini testicle, the coolest thing in the world. Yeah, makes all kinds of cool design. You can see the the energy return. Yeah, it's That's just so amazing. Cool. Maybe use them to drive a motor. Anyway, it's, you know, a lot it's of funny life. because I seen this video of this guy trying to visualize energy um, flowing through a wire by hooking up all these like multimeters and stuff. And I'm like, well, all you need to do is this. <laughs> yeah. Throw a little high voltage in it, see what it does. You know, it doesn't lie to you when it goes through there. That's the one thing about high voltage. It likes to tell you where it flows. It, you know what I mean? Yeah. You get it up to about 30,000 volts, and it likes to tell you exactly where it wants to go, where, you know what I mean? Every direction. So then you put it in low voltage, you know exactly where everything is. So right. Put, so then you can fine tune it at that point. Hmm, that's that's right. a good, good way of looking at it here. I like that. If you put a TV next to it, it'll turn on without oh. plugging. I, I could do it right at my desk right in front of me, and the TV's just fine. But if I put it around 50 to 60 hertz, TV goes completely blank. And if I bring up the uh, EM field, if I try to hook it to something else that's a bit bigger, like a piece of metal or something like that, immediately turns everything off. So even at uh, like 10 feet, it'll start making it change the channel on your TV. You know what I mean, they'll go from tab to tab to tab and start clicking like it's finding different hardware or something attached to your computer. Yeah. Mm. 
So then what is this app? What could we use it for if we can't turn on things with it, you know, without? It's 360 degrees of radiant energy. It's and not like a Tesla that. coil. Tesla coil has a dead zone on top and bottom. Okay. This thing, it's full 360. So if you put it in the center of your device, it's every which direction you want. Uh, so completely useful for different things, you know what I mean? I was thinking to like make a stator coil, put it to pick to put on top of the, the coil, the Tesla coil emission to see what kind of energy you pick up with it. You know? Yeah, I could. Well, for generating well, power. I, I found the only thing you, I, I found the sorry, little, go ahead. I found a little device if you guys can help me identify what it this does. It says signal booster. See this? Yeah. Motor yeah. says broadband drop amp. Uh 52 to 1000 MHZ uh, right. or something. So, so that's to boost your uh, cell phone signal. So it's like a repeater for your cell phone. So if you live in an area like, say, like a, like a valley or a lowland, you hook yes. up that to a, an aerial antenna really high, and uh, it'll make your signal for your cell phone better. So that's what that is. All right. Thank you. So cell phone booster. I didn't know what it was. I just found it in the pile. No, it's good. Uh, yeah, they're <laughs> handy, especially if you live in like in a rural area where the cell phone towers are quite a distance away. Yeah. Or, or I think I, it, in my old house we had a lot of trees. And I think that was part mm. of them. You know. Also, lowland. If you're in the lowland, you mm -hmm. know, cell phone. There's a lot of the cell phone towers. They, they don't think. You know, if you have a mountain, you should take advantage of it. That's where the cell phone, that's where the cell phone tower should be at the highest point, right? Yes. Uh, Gerald's on. Gerald, uh, hey, Gerald, I sent you a link. Hey, Gerald. I, I sent you a link if you want to hop on. It should be in your email. We got one more spot here if you want to jump on. That's cool. Yeah. So, yeah, like, uh, it, it's kind of funny. Like, when I was in the Philippines, that's exactly what they did. All the cell phone towers were on the peaks of mountains and high ground. Mm -hmm. So, like, I could be in the valley, and I was on a river, like, literally on a raft, you know, in the South Philippines with a Rogers phone, <laughs> and I got full bars. <laughs> Yeah, nice. The Asians yeah. are good with the technology, you know. They don't. Oh, they're ahead of us, and their yeah, cell phone rates. mistakes in that area. Their cell phone rates are like so much cheaper than here. We're getting so hosed. <laughs> right, it's true. Oh yeah, like, I know that. I've never been to Asian countries, but in in, in Bulgaria though, the the cell phones a lot cheaper. Oh God, yeah, we're one of the highest paid. Canada and the U.S. are the highest. For uh, cell phone uh, charges, right? I, I pay for six cell phones for me and my kids, and a, a portable Wi-Fi router. Pay six hundred dollars a month. Holy, you're paying six hundred dollars wow. US a month? Yes. Holy, wow, that's, that's a lot. lot. That's yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I I just I just got my daughter a line. Doesn't give her a lot of data, but she's got you know Wi-Fi and you know she's got a cell phone number, and then you know I can text her. You know she's only twelve, but what a month for it? That's nothing, right? About six hundred. Holy cow! Yeah, mind you, have more kids than I do. <laughs> They've got their cell phones, and then they have their. I remember family plans being a lot better than that. And then they have to watch. Do the their whole system so I think it's like baselines like 30 something dollars and then every time you yeah. add a service check out patriot mobile 12 13 dollars like check out patriot mobile patriot mobile. yeah like ten dollars a month or something. who's got the doggy <laughs> i do they're really good oh, oh is that a dog i thought somebody was yelling in the background yeah i've got two uh, somebody had a dungeon or something no, I have them. Uh, 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 <coughs> the, there's a room next to the kitchen because they won't let me. If they hear me on the phone, they'll be jumping on 
me, so I <laughs> try to barricade them in the room while, while I'm doing anything. Hmm. Yeah, it's funny how much we pay. Hey, Gerald, we actually see you. That's like, hey. cool. yeah, look at I never the ball. I'm, I'm trying to get ahead. I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to get ahead. To get ahead. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good. What, what happened? Good. Hey, what happened to your camera? Well, I want to actually see you. There we go. There you go. It's, okay, it's not there we just go. Ahead, no. <laughs> yeah. So how are you guys? Good. 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 I nice. missed the first little bit. I've been busy, busy, busy. Yeah, we've been all. I've been uh, fighting with the car. Got to redo the exhaust of my car. It's falling apart. Oh, so, yeah, I uh, hear that. Yeah. I lost a car like that once. The exhaust yeah. fell off right in front of a cop, and I had uh, <laughs> I had just a, my license just expired. Oh, here goes that car. Yeah, you have a lot of. You, and it you have a lot of. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. You have, you have a lot of great experiences with cops. I noticed. <laughs> It was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> the galaxy far, far away. <laughs> 25, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I've had an interesting life. I don't know what can is. You know what? I always looked at it like this. If you're going to do anything, jump in with both feet. And if you don't lose your legs, then it was a good thing. Right? So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't lose your legs. I just got that one. Yeah. So I got, a, slower. I got a video for you guys to see. Uh, I was hopping the coil again. So this time oh. it goes up a little higher. Nice. I saw that. No, this one's different. I haven't put this one out. I don't know if you guys want to see it or not. Oh, put it up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, can I I'm not sure if I can. I got six spots here. I'm not sure if I can pull up a seventh. A well, if I present, way. would it work that way, or can I even present? Um, well, you could do over your channel that you're on right now, but to yeah. add to my screen, I might not be able to do it because I don't have the full version. Hmm. Well, well, Mike, just pull me off the screen so he can present it. Or I, I could go backstage and then watch from backstage. If you yeah, know. yeah, go back. Yeah, just uh, until uh, Gerald just shows this video quick, and then we'll pop you back on. All right. Uh, how do oh, I? Okay. Out? Uh, uh, just, just yeah, back okay. out and then log back in. Yeah, and just stay backstage. Yeah. All right. Let's give it a shot here. You can. All share right. Your give me one there. sec. I'll just set this video up. I think you can present. It's just, it's just uh, guests. You only have six guests. You can you, they can present though. Okay, I'll have to try that. I haven't tried that. I thought I was capped at six. Okay. okay. So be share screen. Six uh, guests, not six windows. Okay. We'll see how this works. Maybe I can pull her back on in a sec here. She's just on the backstage there, so I can pull her back in anytime. I wish I knew how to share my account on here, and so you know we can add more guests. But I don't even know how to do that. So, all right, can you see that? Okay, I'll pull it up here. There we are. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, let's see if I can get it to play here. I turn it up a little. The volume. Yeah, the volume maybe a little bit. Yeah, I'm at maxing magnets. That's how you calculate the weight. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's smart. What we have here is this coil sitting on this bank. Oh, are they one? Six grams. They're half a gram each. There's 12 of them, so there's six grams there. The coil weighs four and a half. Wow. Oh, nice. Nice. That's cool. So, what are you doing there? Are you pulsing it with forward DC or what? 
Uh, I'm just pulsing the backside of the circuit from the cap bank, but now making you know, mm. making like a rail gun there. No, you can't yeah. make it like a rail gun though, because it's the coil that's hopping, right? Uh, well, yeah. If you were to see, if you were to stationary the coil, then you could send something through the center of the coil, like iron or whatever. Maybe. No, not maybe. Definitely, it's you know, it's a solenoid operation. You know, you can you know they already make these these guns that are coils. You know, that yeah, rail guns. Yeah. Of, what do you call it? Oh, uh, the miller uh, rail guns. Rail guns. Uh, yeah. U.S. Yeah, the U.S. military or the U.S. Navy is actually working on some very big prototypes, and they're scary. They're super powerful. Yeah, I don't want to make no uh, nothing like that. I'll tell you. Hey Ben, we can hear you typing. Oh. <laughs> I think they make it to launch uh, up into 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 orbit. Oh, right, here we go. Let's see. Can't get away now. <laughs> How much nice. that thing must have weighed a pound? No, half a pound. And that's it. So I'll stop sharing. How, How much uh, power were you actually putting into that? You know what? Uh, I was just using that wall plug. And it was literally one pulse, 23 hmm. volts, bang, that's through it. Diode. That's it. Eh? Nope, through my circuit. Is it rectified? Of it. Okay, so it's a modified jewel thief. Well, it's not so modified. Where Bedini takes the uh, power from the diode off of the base and it goes to your secondary battery for charging, I take that. And I fill a capacitor bank with it, and I use the capacitor bank to make the coil hop, and it hops with a lot of force. You mean the anode? It, you could call it that. I, I remember I I said before I'm only showing a pittance because there's certain things mm -hmm. I don't want to show on YouTube that might just get it taken yeah. off. <laughs> Kill my algorithm, man. <laughs> so I'm only showing little bits and pieces so that everybody gets the idea what I'm doing and what I can do. Very nice. I'm just going to scoot up for a quick smoke. You guys just carry on. I'll be back. What was the cap, the cap value on the voltage? What, what, what did you pump it up to? What's that? What did you bring the cap value up to? It was at 23. 23 volts. 23 volts. I showed it on the camera. Oh, I didn't see. It's hard to yeah. see. The reason why it's got such force is because of the geometrical form of the coil itself. It compresses that field in such a dense spot all at once that it pushes off. Hmm. But now again, that's sitting above a magnet. I haven't showed anything else. 23 volts is not a lot. Yeah. I like the other one where you had the little stick and you showed it jump first a little bit and then it jumped off of it. That was beautiful. Well, what I just showed you guys, picture this. Uh, maybe I should just wait and show it to you guys during the presentation. <laughs> so that hopping, let's say, let's say, for instance, it's possible. I'm not saying I've done it. I'm saying let's say it's possible that you could levitate it a little bit off the magnet and then hit that big hop, watch it jump and then stop higher up and then hit it again. I'm just saying. It's, yeah, you know, yeah, you're just saying, huh? It's, that's all I'm saying. I, 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 I haven't done it. it hiding it from us. You're hiding it from us. Possible, but uh, we'll see, right? I guess during the presentation, we'll it's possible there's a testicle behind me. It's the same thing. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I mean. <laughs> no, I just think it's possible. I just, I haven't achieved. You can't do it with direct current unless it's pulsed or you have frequency from AC or something. Like quantum superposition. How could I have that considering that the uh, function generator was off? Well, you did pulse it when you made that one contact. That's, That's one true. Pulse. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you did so disconnect right after you connected. So that, that 
it completes the pulse. But <laughs> if I held it there, what and it would, would not be a pulse. Was, it would not be a pulse. It'd be constant current. So this it. much I can say: if I held it there, the coil would have came down so much, but it would have stopped, and it would have been way higher than you guys are used to seeing, maybe six to eight inches. Hmm. Right, because you're keeping the, the EMF flowing through the coil constantly, so there's no no reason for it to come down. It, it should stay up. That that could be it. Yeah. Unless, definite, you know, the battery a dies. A definite possibility. <laughs> a definite possibility. Let's just say that. Yeah, you know, I'd be curious while you do it, just take a piece of tin foil, just a thin little piece, mm -hmm. and just see if the uh, piece of wood lets it stick to it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just see if it's got any uh, pull to it, like a charge in it. Well, you, you, uh, you want to hit it with square wave, high frequency square wave. No, that's not what I'm getting at. I'm just wondering what his coil is putting off. So depending on what it puts off, if you put it off enough, uh, you know, light amps on it, you might get a charge on your on the wood. You know what? Uh, I tried your experiment when I reversed the polarity on the coil, and I and I didn't use high voltage i only used 24 volts and it sucked right down to the wood and when i went to pick it up you could feel the force oh yeah yeah so it definitely changes it now when it comes to doing the charging of the surface and the hopping i don't think i'm at the right voltages yet i need to use the uh, circuit that jeremiah pop built for me it it goes from low to high voltage and from low frequency to high frequency, you're able to change it to. It's kind of like a function generator in a way, I guess. It's, it's a neat little circuit. So I need to try that to see if what you and I were talking about works. But hmm. I'm seeing signs that it's going to. So Yeah. I have <laughs> yeah. a feeling you're right there with all the stuff yeah. that I've been seeing. By the yeah, way, did, yeah. you, did you understand what I was trying to tell you on your page? That it's not a... A uh, Taurus with a donut around it, like it's not. No, not it's, a, it's not a toroidal with just a hoop around it, and that's the feel. It's a spiral. It keeps yes. getting bigger, and yep. it keeps compacting the center, like you're pushing rods down in it until you know. What I mean, they get so compact that it it just condenses the energy into one single singularity, while the outside energy gets bigger to come into it. You're so right. It's a, like it's a black a hole? Spiraled. It's well, an omni, uh, omnidirectional a hoop. It's a three-dimensional omnidirectional uh, Not spiral. quite. Nathan's got, he, he's got the right idea. It's a huge vortex. It's omnidirectional. And then when it comes to the center of the coil, it compresses. But because of the way that the coil is wound, it actually compresses into the form of a sphere. And omnidirectional means spheres. donuts. Donut. That's what omnidirectional means. Yeah, and then there's two sm two spheres on the inside of that, a positive and a negative, and they're chasing each other. And right. it pushes not, not the energy two, outside two. like a disc. They're not two. There's there's two flows. Not yeah. just two lines. There's two flows, and those lines are spiraling all around uh, in two different directions. Uh, of course, this way too, in two different directions, yeah, both ways, horizontal. Yeah, horizontal. I kind of see where you would see that. I know what you mean, and I know what Nathan means. Too. Okay, so conventional current is is the what we use to describe everything because it's just easier. Only that's the only reason. Yeah, but, but this is not AC or DC, and it acts no. nothing like it. No, conventional no, current is described in one direction, from plus to minus. But we as but there mean, there there's no plus or minus point. on this. It's a it's a vortex, so yes, I it's know. a flow. And, and the it's a flow. He knows that too, but they don't discuss it in that way because it gets too confusing. So conventionally, it's not confusing at all. It no. makes it more confusing when you try to put it in base terms like a Steinmetz. Yeah, because Steinmetz, the way that he put it, he literally canceled out the ether scalar wave. That's right. Third component. The, the well, component is the most important. More confusing for troubleshooting circuits. Yeah, but you're not troubleshooting the circuit. You're, you're building a vortex. It's completely different. Yeah, well, building and troubleshooting and understanding circuits, not just troubleshooting, building and understanding them. A lot of reasons why conventional current is described in one direction, not just one. 
I understand that, but that's not what he's creating. We should just try to learn with that one But that's not what he's creating. You can't put it in conventional terms because you just get it wrong. Understand that the scientific and electrical community realizes what you realize. Yeah, but that's why they've gotten nowhere. That's why they've gotten nowhere, Mike, because they don't understand this. They still see it like you do with AC and DC. They don't see it right. No, they don't see it right. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Baloney. This is why people don't even understand Bedini's work. They don't understand the spike. They don't understand the most important part of the circuit. They think it getting the mesmerized by other garbage in it. I saw it yesterday when we were watching Ben's video. All the garbage around it, and the answer was right there in front of him. Yeah, right there. He explains it. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. you know, yeah. it's hard to train people that way. It makes it harder to teach. But yeah, but that's just the point, though. If people weren't trained in the classical electrical engineering, and they were trained right from the start, knowing that there's a third component that's ignored, then maybe they build systems in order to bring that component out, and we wouldn't have to deal with this lack and the crap that everybody keeps building. That's just my opinion. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> because well, the geometry that, thing in there that, that takes that vortex to another level. They call that conventional correct yeah. so for, for, for just understanding sakes, not for reality sake. For I get that. For understanding sake. That's why they call that. it conventional current for the understanding sake, not the reality sake. I, I guess what we're saying is we don't care what they say. We're trying to get an understanding so we can build the system. And if we keep, oh, you're this, right. It does flow in both directions, but conventional current flows forward. I hope I'm not the yelling. The we're talking about flows the it also flows forward and backwards. You know, because we're talking about no, no, no. yeah, I think you're missing it. Some things flow on the outside. Some things flow on the inside. There's more to it than just back and forth. Yeah, yeah. I think every. Uh, I think a lot of. I think a lot. Of, I think a lot of the mainstream science they don't take into account the heavy side component. Right. I think that's what uh, Nathan's talking about. The heavy side component is there. You know, there's a field on the outside. And with current, it's moving, it's in motion, as well as the current going through around the wire itself. And the heavy side component is probably a lot of conventional science doesn't look at. Yeah, but even, even Steinmetz acknowledged it when he looked at two wires and said the field around the wires, okay, when they're bare versus when they're shielded. So Steinmetz knew it was there, but he used the shielding to get rid of it. Yeah. Okay, that's why it's important yeah. to know both because you know what he got rid of that Tesla used, and, and that was the same yeah, thing. But right. that's and the same right. thing that uh, Gerard Morin was saying is the energy was flowing on the outside, not on the inside. Just a little right. bit on the inside to, to make it follow or track with it. That's it. That, yeah. That's the biggest difference in it. And even Steinmetz knew it was there, and he right. worked and to he, get rid of it. And he was the last, probably of the old school engineer that realized and knew this stuff well, yeah but guys right after, you know, after, after, science after, does recognize what you are talking about yeah, yeah but that's not, just they do the not point. they do not do not recognize it they do recognize it and they do explain the current on the outside of the wire very clearly in conventional science they just do not teach with with that they teach with the uh the AC, flow that AC, goes AC, inside AC, the coil yeah. they don't teach with the flow that goes outside the coil they yeah, but that's where the disconnect is. That's well, right. where that's you where all these the outside that's where all the backyard right. mechanics don't get to play. That's where the 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 inventors yeah. get stopped dead cold because the electrical engineering society has decided that it is to be like this and spoken of like this and written like this. Well, they you know teach, what? scientifically they teach <laughs> electricity with the way we're teaching it forward and backwards, but conventionally for the for the conventional reasons, they do not. They teach it in one direction. I so, get but scientifically, when it's taught, it's taught that the energy flows in the opposite direction on the outside of the wire. This is shown in black and white videos. Come on. Hold on. Hold on. I can tell you right now from the math that they do and what they're quantifying, they are not calculating it. I'm sorry. They have a view oh, like God, yours when they calculate. 
Not so they don't get it. I, I can tell you that from looking at the math. It takes two seconds to look, to point it out. They absolutely do not calculate it right because well, they don't know the ins right. and outs of it. They, it my system itself it proves it. Everything that they try and cancel out in their electrical engineering circuits and, and well, building of anything, well, I literally use in my system. <laughs> my system wouldn't work yeah. without it. Everything that dumps the ground is what you use. Let me throw a picture out yeah. to you guys of trying to calculate yeah, amperage with non-conventional current. You're going to see no current flow because it's going to be going one way and the other, and it's going to cancel the flow altogether. Your meter's not going to move. So they make meters That's to read right. one direction. You see, you can't... Okay, there's another reason why for you. Yeah, yeah and if, if I was building my house, that'd be perfect advice. I'd absolutely follow it. You can't but measure. That's not what I'm building here. You can't measure it unless it's conventionally measured. You can't measure this anyway. That vortex, you can't measure with any tool yeah. you have. That's you don't have a tool that can measure it. I'm talking about electricity in general. You can't measure it. Yeah, anymore. well, anybody can measure that. That's fairly simple. I could wire my whole freaking house right now, man. That's easy. That's easy compared to what we're doing. But, but try to measure the AC wave going in two directions <coughs> with the meter. It, you won't be able to. But meter, I, don't, I don't care. I just don't care. It's not something that I'm interested in. I want this extra energy. I want the dark energy. I want the spikes. I want the potential. I don't care about AC and DC. They're a means to an end for me. They, you have to use what you have to use in the circuit, but in the end, we want the vortex energy. It's all we're looking for. You know what I'm finding with this uh, <coughs> vortex is? These coils don't just have, uh, I guess, pulse DC would be considered a form of AC. So they don't just have AC. They have AC and DC. It's just manipulating the fields in the right way, like what you're trying to do with the gravel flyer. It's going to make this thing hop and settle, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, yeah, I have, agree. Yeah. Kind of, go ahead. You have full control over a DC pulse where an AC, most AC generators are designed to run, you know, in North America, 60 hertz. Or if yeah. you live in Europe, it's 50 hertz. I call you it the zombie. Yeah, it's the zombie uh, frequencies. Exactly. Right? You it's know, just straight, it's, uh, 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 like... Yeah, like 60 hertz, believe it or not, is more parasitic to the human body than 50 hertz. Yep, you know, absolutely. Hertz signal, yeah. So, you know, that's why everybody's, you know, so disconnected and they got all these mental issues and everything. It's all the 60 hertz that we're using is just screwing around with our biological system. Then they used to use like 120 hertz or 130 or something like that. And then they changed Probably. it. I think I Tesla know. was probably. I, I think Tesla was working with it, but I think because of the current purposes, they wanted him to drop it down to a sixty hertz frequency. But I don't uh, think it was Tesla that did it. It was uh, Steinmetz. It was Steinmetz did, designed it like that. Yeah. Yeah, it for through GE, he he changed it because they were yeah. much higher, and then they had like two pole and three pole. You know what I mean? Three, yeah. two phase, three phase. You know what I mean? Yeah. Going on, they had to put it all together at one. GE right. ran the world for the longest time. Or yeah, at least yeah. had a good hand yeah, they, in it, you know. So yeah, well well Starless was the grid the brings in like seven thousand volts into one phase and then splits it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's why most factories now run on a three phase system, right? Seven thousand you know, volts yeah. AC. Oof. Like we have a 44,000 volt transformer outside of my work. 4K to 7K. Yeah. Nice. Right? So, and then it steps down. A lot of our machinery run at 480 volts. Uh, then you got your welding, all the welding rigs in there. You know, you're talking huge amounts of reactive current going through that building. So that's why we have a transformer outside the building because the demand is just so huge, right? Yeah, I guess if you're welding all the time, eh? Oh god, yeah. You know, and we have probably about 25, 30 welding stations, you know. That's straight yeah. current. Yeah. I believe there's reaction. another way. What are you guys making? Uh well, I can't really talk about time. 
<laughs> that many well that many welding machines like what do you make a time yeah. machine well <laughs> the mean, company it's, makes it sounds go ahead we're a subcontractor for nato so i'll let you figure it out oh so you make all kinds of stuff that's good uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, nothing, so, nothing we can hear about. Yeah, let, let, let's not get you know YouTube uh, uh, shadow ban. You know, for so, words, so, but yeah, you know, exactly. I, I get it. We're yeah. being listened to, you guys, by multiple people, and I love it. Do you guys realize yeah. that uh, Michael Perone, an alien scientist, after our last live, was discussing mm -hmm. the very tech that we were discussing and actually uh agreeing that over unity is possible i don't know if you guys caught that yeah it was no i didn't watch the show so what, what what did they exactly say well michael perone was bringing up the fact that uh electromagnetic frequencies and electromagnetic systems might actually have a key or there might be something there when it comes to over unity and then he well, referenced course. a few systems, not ours, mind you, but uh, he's starting to think outside the box, I think. <laughs> I like Michael Brown, but he's really in the books kind of a guy, right? And, and hey, that's cool, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't follow the rules. That's my system's based on not following the rules. In yep. fact, well, it, the rules well, it's the thing. You know, Mike, so, what do you know about borophene? You know, like all, of, all our system, all of our systems that we use today are a closed circuit. Since you open it up to the outside environment, allow energy to flow into the, the closed system. Now you've got more energy coming into the system that you're actually using to produce it. So yes. you're 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 opening up an orifice into the closed circuit. And uh, Bearden talks about this a lot too. Yeah. And the other technique that's very important to this component is you cannot kill the dipole. So you have to somehow harness the energy that's coming into that system in a way that it's not killing the dipole. And it took me a long time to figure out exactly what he meant by it and how to actually do it. The open core dipole. So in very well, simplistic terms, what does that mean, not killing the dipole? Okay, well, well I see. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Gerald. Go ahead, Gerald. Well, I was just going to talk about an open circuit, which which could go to explaining the dipole, like an open circuit and a closed circuit. So in the system that I use, <coughs> or we'll say, for instance, a battery and a light bulb, that's a closed circuit. And all it's right. doing is draining the power from the battery to light the light bulb. Right. And when there's no much, no more power, the light bulb shuts off. So to give you a visual of what I'm doing, I'm turning the power for the light on really quick and creating uh, An open load like a burst of energy so that entropy can start right away. But before right. entropy goes completely and drains the battery, I give it another kick, kind of like a swing on a pendulum. Right? Mm, right. As and long as you have do that. As long as you have right. As long as you, I think the point what he was getting at is non-equilibrium. As soon as you have equilibrium, that's mm. when things die off. When yeah. you keep the the, the uh, unequilibrium the system can regenerate itself. Right. Yeah, like Everything's the, looking for balance. Right, because Everything. nature's going to kick in and try to equalize the system. Yeah, right. because uh, equal, equilibrium means entropy. Equilibrium means a balance yeah. of both sides, right? That's when the battery right. and, the, and the bulb doesn't work. So, yeah. so if you have a system with, with a power that's enormous on one side and it's really small on the other side, the system is going or the nature is going to kick in and try to equalize that by giving it a kick of extra energy. In most of the time, we so, ignore that extra energy. So a per, another good example of what Gerald was talking about, the closed circuit, so you have battery running a light, okay? So let's change the circuit a little bit, okay? So one part, say the positive coming off the light, say we put a very large coil there. And instead of using just regular straight DC current, let's start pulsing it now. So now 
you've opened up the circuit to a back EMF. The back EMF collapse emanates around outside of that closed circuit. So that coil is the orifice. Outside the open core. That's right. Not That's the right. closed core, which is a round ring toroid core. That's a closed no. core. BDD we're, doesn't we're talking... use that kind of core. He uses a straight bar so we, open core. Can we so visualize outside happens, outside Can we visualize back in the EMF as like a, um, a reverberance of the signal itself or an interaction between something else? Well, well how's the back EMF going to flow around a ring core? It's, it's, you can, it's I think it's called a resonant frequency. Here. Like a resonant frequency, like the second frequency. Well, yeah, when you get your coil into a resonant frequency, that's when it's at its optimal uh, operation, right? Re Re resonant frequency is two frequencies with a pulse, right? Okay. And it'll it's got to have that pulse in it. It's like an amplification of those frequencies. Hmm. And meanwhile, exactly, all exactly what I'm using. Yeah. So. Even just running power through a wire, that wire is now going to create a magnetic field. So if it's running straight DC, you cannot harness any power from outside the system. As soon as you start pulsing it through a coil, now you're creating a massive field, and now the field is interacting with free space where energy exists, and it collapses. Now you're going to draw or open up that orifice of energy into the closed circuit system now. Now so imagine that you... collapse with a toroid core. Imagine so, so that it's like a vacuum. A core. It's not the same thing. It doesn't does matter. It like what a vacuum, kind of... How does it collapse back onto the toroidal core? It doesn't. It goes to the center of the toroid, not not back in. That's the that's where zero point is. Yeah, because the wave motion on a far core, it's different. Very sharply. Different thing happening here. So if you're a using toroid. DC, it depends if you have an open core or a closed core because it'll it'll make a difference. Gerald has an open one, but Dini has a closed one because he fills his core with rods, where Gerald has an open air. Right. Yeah, open. So yeah. two two different <coughs> effects completely when you do it. Yeah. All right, Gerald, you gonna school us? I don't know about that. I'm trying to draw it really fast, and it's not going to work well. well anyway, the flux in the core, in a toroidal core, it has a hard way of escaping, whereas it's a bar core. It has two well, open Well, it's ends. closed. It's, it's a two closed open on that bar core, and the flux can escape as well as enter. When you have a toroidal core, it's closed. It's closed, so right. So how is your flux going to escape or anything on the outside get in? I'm not, I'm not talking about a toroidal core. I'm talking a regular... Run of the mill coil around. You know, right. just, I'm not so talking about a closed that's what an open not, circuit is, a bar core. A closed circuit is a round core. It's when you're talking about the right EMF. Of the, yeah, I wasn't talking about that. I'm talking about an open core. I know you were. But we were also talking about closed circuits. So I wanted to explain that. I'm drawing this totally backwards here. Let me see if I can do this. <laughs> So that's why I think yeah. the Bedini went with the open core, open circuit. Of course, because that was the way he was getting the radiant energy spike into the system. Right. And I don't think he would have gotten the radiant would get into a, a ring core is what I'm saying. Because there's no open ends. It has uh, to be an open core. Has to be. I think ring core is totally good if you want to spend power, you know, and hold on to it. You know. <laughs> Give me a sec. Got a lot of typing to do there, Ben. <laughs> you said what? Sounds like... <laughs> Got a lot of typing to do there? Yeah, like I'm Charlie not talking to Sean. Like... Sounds like he's got an old school typewriter over there. You just got to yeah, pull yeah, the lever and yeah. pull it back. That's right, with a ding. <laughs> he's a fast oh, typer. Oh, wow. Hold on, sometimes... Ding. <laughs> Sometimes it defaults. Yeah, my bad. It defaulted to my uh, webcam audio mic. So let me change that. Let's say this is a wire. I don't know if you can see that. All right. The glare is probably. Well, you can see it. Go ahead. Okay. okay yeah, so when you pulse power through, 
it goes through the center, but it goes this way. Can you way, enlarge right? his crane? Uh, Can you yep. enlarge his crane? Yep. Uh, but then there's also here. energy that goes on the outside of the wire, and it goes in a circle. I know I'm going to screw this up here. Hopefully, I can get this right. But your power goes around the wire in one direction, and it goes through the wire in the other direction. And there's your current. So when you pulse a bunch of power through, you're only you're not getting all your back EMF in your line. You're canceling out so much of it, right? So your current can flow through better than it would as if you were going straight DC. Because if you're going straight DC, you get all this current that goes around the wire slowing down the current that goes through the wire. And that's why you get that heating up. Does that make up, right? sense? You know, you're right. Yeah. It builds up. You, that you know. makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Gerald. Perfect, okay. <laughs> so now with, with my coil, Mike's talking about how a toroid, it's a closed circuit. But my coil doesn't work like that. It works like a series of line inductors. And it pushes the energy out around it like a spiral like nathan was talking about but then it mm. comes that spiral comes into a fine point this is the fine point but because you have a north and a south pole uh, i was talking about iron core not the core of a coil an iron, iron okay core. fair enough but i thought you were talking about a toroid my point was you got a north and a south here and when that Vortex comes in. I know I'm messing this up, guys. And it focuses right here in the center. On the blotch wall. Right? Blotch wall. And exactly. And then you'll have another one that comes down out of the bottom. But in the center of the coil, you'll have your north. And you'll have your south chasing each other. Because your vortex from the bottom is south. Right in the opposite direction of the one coming up top but they meet in the middle from that compression that energy density right. and then they chase yeah. each other and that's what pushes right. the energy out right so when that's they spin, and there's and they're spinning gyroscopically yes they're also right. spinning like this and that coil right. is coreless it's a coreless coil right yes, yes. yeah do you, do you think energy, you can coreless not core coreless do you think yes. you can uh, no like be able to have control to maneuver this thing up or sideways or you know just absolutely the actually okay. the video i just showed you guys i didn't bring it up but i wanted to see if anybody else would pick it up not too many people did well actually i don't think any of you did when the coil hopped and pushed that aluminum can up and shot forward mm -hmm. there's a reason why it did if you watch the way I put the coil on the magnet, I off-centered it just a little so that that magnetic field would push it out the back like a squeeze. And when it went to hop, it hit the aluminum cap, flipped it, and shot it out forward. It's kind well, of there is a way to, yeah, I like to control sure, it. You can use the same mechanism to do it. <coughs> so I'm done presenting this year where you can... Sure. You can use that same effect to make a relay. <laughs> just kidding. What's that, Mike? I said you that same effect that you just uh, described, you could use it to make a relay. Yeah. And let's say you got a coil here, right? Oh, you got a bunch of pickup <laughs> coils on the outside. Let's say, for instance, this sucker can float. <clears throat> well, these are electromagnets, and they go all, they're all the way around, right? So in theory, well, listen, the coil here, if it was floating, right, and these are attached to the coil, in theory, because they're electromagnets or scalar magnets or call it whatever you want, when you pull more power into this one, it squeezes the, the back end of this field and it pushes the coil this way, mm -hmm. from my experience. 
And so if you, I put, you'd have maneuverability like very easily just by controlling which from 12 separate, you want to. From 12 separate points yeah, around the core. that's interesting. Oh. Yeah. Look, so now I'm being presented. <laughs> Are they in series? Yeah, that's very, they're very important for propulsion. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're not in series, Mike. They could yeah, be. They your, they could be, though. Your burst uh, of energy comes to the center of that core, though. So when you want to go super fast, you have to take advantage of those funnels in, in, in order to get it. So you have to bring the energy higher to the funnel in order to get it to go in one direction faster. Yes. So you go side to side with the other ones, but the other one has to be going that way. Because it's like with well, Schauberger, when you put it in there, you're sucking yourself through the vortex. Yeah, that's Schauberger device. Yes. No, man. Yes, and what you could do though is reduce your pressure uh, from being pushed up, and and add the pressure from behind like a pinch, so you'd be going at an angle, or you would turn your power down to the point where you're just about to fall, and then you would push power into the back end and shoot forward. Now check this out: the B two bomber uses the uh, ability to put the static on the outside, giving it easier access to go fast through the air. You know what I'm saying? So you're yeah. actually eliminating a lot of inertia because of your vortex in the center. That's why they move that way. Because that, that's the exact reason. We already have the technology. It just needs to be amplified with the vortex. So they don't have that in that in that bomber. Okay, so from my, my recent, my very near recent research, I believe that AC has to be on the outside for the skin, and it's DC on the inside column. Know what I mean? Well, you gotta have a you gotta have more like a potential than, than an AC, I think. It's gotta yeah, interact yeah, with okay. the environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the environment's gonna give it more energy because when yeah. you get up in the atmosphere, you get you get energy. So you're just like running a corona motor at that point. So you need that static to, to blend with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. For every what is it? For every three feet, it's a hundred volts of potential. I think that's how it works. Every meter, it's a hundred, a uh, hundred volts of potential. So, yeah. And if that, if you can collect that static while you're up there, you can stay up forever. That's exactly what Otis T. Yeah. Carr was saying with the OX, uh, whatever X one. That's the machine yeah. he was talking about where he got over Unity. It wasn't on the ground that he got over Unity. It's when he got up in the atmosphere he got over Unity. That was yep. that was the kicker right there. Yeah, that's very interesting, Nathan. Just set that sucker to float and just zap the energy off of it all day long. Yep, because all he's doing, all he's doing, is creating a spike like a bedini right into a capacitor that goes into his Tesla coil in the center. Mm -hmm. This isn't difficult. He, he's oscillating it in the center in that Tesla coil, and then the Tesla coil itself puts a longitudinal wave out. So if you had a hollow Tesla coil in one of these, uh, you know, UFOs. You yeah. would get the same thing. You'd be able to create the vortex easily because it's not unlike a uh, when you spin a UFO in the shape that it is, it's just like the uh, Tesla turbine blade. It'll bring it up and in and then down back in. Right. So you're going to be able to take care of the energy that way. So if you could think about it that way, I run the gravity flyer without a shell, but if I put a shell on it, it completely changed everything. See, but mine's two toroidals, not one. So your coil's one. I got two, which makes it more like a magnetosphere and a balanced. Yeah. And it makes it more of a field generator than it is a machine like yours. Yeah, I get what you see. I, I get what you mean by that totally. Coming in clear, Nathan. Huh. Strange, wonder, isn't it? Now I see now I see why you're you gotta you gotta hit it. In order for those two fields to come together, and once they do, you're gonna get that hop. Because uh, see that, yep. Uh, remember your bubbles. You you had the two wow. bubbles, right? And, well, and, and you made one bubble, then you made yep. your second bubble, and your coils above it, right? Now I need to squeeze it in between the two, just like you did, and pop it. It's like pushing down on a balloon and then letting it off. I just gotta find what pressure I need. That's all in this balloon. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it is. Yeah, we're like working on the same thing, but they're a bit different. Like, if you put your coil in the center, 
and then I put a plate uh, spinning around it just with an open hole in the center. Yeah. I, I can get a field to generate like everywhere around this thing. I could get oh, you yeah. a field on the outside and I can get you a big field on the, you know, even further than that, I can get them to interact for you. I can get you everything that you want with that coil, you know what I mean, in the center perfectly. So we can go to outer space or whatever you want. We got like a force field around it. Tell you, these people that work on this thing have no idea how this field works. It, nice. It's it's a specialty field, man. It's it's yeah. like a, I got stuck with a field generator that actually just lifts occasionally. You know what so I mean? Once you once you've created that bubble, have you tried the um, the radio thing yet? The radio experiment? No, I haven't. Yeah. I got to pick up an old radio. I'll tell you. Um, Somebody suggested something to me the other day that was kind of eye-opening and possible but not sure about yet. When you're creating a bubble and it's uh, you can pick it up in the static of an AM radio, you're creating a field, but a forced field, a field that can't be penetrated by electromagnetic signals whatsoever. So you're essentially creating a force field. Yeah, It ain't going to stop bullets, but... There's no signal we're going to get inside. Cell phones don't work with my coils on. I, I, I can't run tests in the house when, you know, people are walking around because I'll kill their phone. <laughs> nice. And so, yeah, it's... Uh, Turn it on when it's Thanksgiving time and the in-laws get a little crazy. Oh, yeah. It, then they don't have any like phones nice. anymore. Oh, yeah. You kill their phone, yeah. <laughs> That's like... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Wi-Fi. I I have to. Uh, I can't do tests in the house anymore because I've killed three Wi-Fi boxes, and they keep replacing them. Right, and they're like, I don't know why these things are blowing, but uh, you're, you're I don't killing know. people's right. internet now. That's not funny. Man. <laughs> hey, Jeff. Jeff, I blew out one of my hearing aids the other day with my ultrasound. It just exploded in my ear. Ouch. Yeah. Hey. Oh, so yeah. I had to bring I had to bring it in and get it replaced. They, how, how did it break? I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> no clue. It just stopped working. What else do you say, right? I mean, that thing's dangerous. Well, hope, yeah, yeah everything's dangerous you okay. when you got free energy sitting around you everywhere. God, you know what? Yeah, the space is saturated. If you, yeah, if if you hook up your table like this one right here behind me, pressure, pressure it's wave. all metal. Hook it up to something like that to the uh, gravity flyer. Say good night to every electronics in the room. I think it just starts that, shattering them, and then you'll you'll feel the field coming out and busting everything as it goes, and you'll start having to replace everything. You're and, creating and pressure waves inside your garage. Yeah, and then the it's FCC. a condensed area. Yeah, <laughs> so so like that's what I say. If I put a shell around this thing, it would completely change how it works. That's what I'm doing with my garage. It's the shell. Yep. My garage is the shell right now. So it has to be outside. Oh, you think except, that's what it is? Except for when your shell grows hmm. exponentially huge. Like well, the how does glass house. react? To See, but you don't, you don't have a Tesla coil field holding it in. I that's, don't need that, that's, the, that's the whole reason to put the fields on it like I do, is the Tesla coil holds in all that energy that would normally go out to the rest of your room. Yeah, it'll hold it in a bubble, and it won't right. let it go. Yeah, it, it, see, you have, you have to apply the field the right way, but it, it, it'll hold it in. I do it with high voltage all the time. I see. see what like uh, I'm getting the bubble, but my bubbles like your no, your fields is going everywhere. It's it's creating a bunch of static. What yeah. I'm saying is, if you put a Tesla coil on it, it'll suck that bubble right back together. Now, I'll talk to you about it later, but it has yeah. to do with. How mine works versus how yours works, and combining them would change yeah, the well, whole experiment. I, I want to do that. This kind of this kind of sparks a, a memory. Uh, John Hutchison, back in the eighties, he had uh, several Van de Graaff generators. He had Tesla coils. And he had a whole bunch of stuff going on at the same time. He got it into, I guess, creating that bubble that you guys are referring to. Yeah. He actually made one of he actually made one of his laboratories disappear. Yeah. Vanished. You know he what, he a, what you said? Laboratory. He, he, mm -hmm. You know what he does? The talk entire about building much? disappeared. He did that. Why he had, You know what he doesn't <laughs> talk about much? 
Why Where he did had he go? He shrunk his he left foot. It didn't disappear. He shrunk it. Hold on, guys. Hold on, guys. Uh, what, Gerald, what do you say? He doesn't talk it, about this at all. I don't even know if he'll bring it up. He's no, brought he it up won't. before, but the reason why he had to get out of uh, New Westminster in British Columbia was because yeah. when he was doing tests in his apartment, Things were lifting in other people's apartments. And apartments. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. Floating. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's why yeah. He when he's in his building, he didn't. He told me he that took the whole building, and he was done. Yeah. He threw him out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, they, he told me that story personally yep. in 2005. Yep. I, he, I he sent his videos to the government. Um, they sh they sent them back. I think I told you guys this, and and they said, "Do you realize, like, if you pause it at certain frames, your your items are just completely disappearing and then reappearing?" Yes. Yeah. 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 It's basically the Philadelphia Absolutely. experiment that he recreated. Where do you think, like, as you guys, where do you think this stuff goes, and like into an invisible spectrum or where? Nobody like, knows. It, like, <laughs> changes the frequency. It goes, it goes Bob, Lazar says, no. Bob Lazar says because stars can. Has so much gravity that they can bend light around them. That that's what yeah, happens. We're not they go, they go invisible. Star. They don't go anywhere. They go. That's invisible. not changing the gravity. In it. It's it's it, changing it, the frequency. Yeah. Well, it's whatever yeah, does, the, the cup or whatever that it's, disappeared, probably its gravity uh, properties change. So is it, it getting it started is bending it, light around it? So no, is, it's going it started bending light around itself. Like the star bends light around through the like gravity of the star. Right now, the same thing happening. So is it still there? Is it it's still probably there, still but there, but the light's going around it, so you're not seeing it. It's more. It's going that. into count. It's going into but, counter space. I think well, it's. Well, let's say if I, I have, I don't know. Okay, so if I have a stick and and then he's doing his experiment, and I poke it with a stick. Am I gonna feel something or not really? Like you know. I no, it's gone. It's no, gone. It's gone. It's gone. Okay, so then so the light's not bending it. So think about this. It, oh, hold on. Molecules if, in if you create a gravity light. field to bend light, I'm sure it's doing more than just bending the light. It's bending time also. Yeah, it's changing the time. So of from the there energy you can, you can extrapolate, uh, extrapolate what happened to the cup. <laughs> so the theory is if you change the energy of the molecules it's in a different time it is, it's still there it but in a different is, time then when those molecules energies change you change the time differential on that and it literally shifts into a different timeline you yeah, can't so see it you can't feel it because it ain't there it's in a no, different time the cup's still in the same place just it's just there in 1950 not 2024. Dude, it's in the same cup uh, the same cup same table but in 1950. Or different Jeez, table, or whatever. God, do, do you understand? Too. Okay, do you understand the significance of this? It means we can actually gravity send field. messages back to the the past, or we can send yeah, things with to the future. Fields. I don't know about that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you can not? with gravity fields because it would take another exact same system in that timeline for you to communicate with, in order for you to have that link. That's you for bidirectional communication, hold. not one way. You the time machine paradox. That's you can only travel back in time back as far as you made the way. machine. You could do one way and <coughs> get a message back. So Nathan um, can guys. have one of my coils, and in 10 years from now, as I'm running the coil here, if this was to work, this is in theory, he can turn on the coil and talk to me 10 years in the past from the future because he has that identical coil, and he changes all the energy in his molecules to match the energy of the molecules of where I'm at in my time, so we're able to talk. Does that make that's sense? Quantum, that's quantum entanglement there. Yeah, I guess you could call it that. So yeah, the, the I think band, you're yeah. I think you're pulling a Stargate out of phase. Right. Maybe where, where they're just in a, in, a, in a kind of a different area, the same area, but you you can't interact with them. But then how does that explain the fact that if you can't interact with them, you'd be able to, wouldn't you be able to feel the same mass in the same space? No. Well, maybe there's a space that nobody can interact with. None of the dimensions. It's That's interesting. The, it's an inter intermediate. I love time paradox. Like the, flat, the flat. You know the flash, how he goes to. Well, like can walk around. ranch. The flash goes to a different phase. place that only he can go to because he's got light speed. It's called the. The light force, w or whatever. Wouldn't it be determinant that the actual location has to be the same, though? 
you can't change like different locations. That's mm. my thought process. The location mm. it has to be the same, but the energy changes and therefore the time on that changes. You guys, you guys are, just think okay, about well, it this way. You're you're in a room, so you're filling that room with the energy, but you don't have to fill the room. You can create the bubble around yourself. Yep. It's not it's not that difficult. You just have to create the right suit, like I said before, like a Tron suit, but the disc on the back. Well, we have to think and then you that. walk around at a phase. Stuff, man. Yes. That's, <laughs> that's the difference. The world still acts the same around you. The people and things in it though change. Okay, but now my faster thought or slower or whatever. It yeah. would be like if I came to you at a phase and I walked over to your tube TV, I can interact with it because of the energy and I can write you a message on your tube TV. Right, because that tube TV has That's more than possible. one phase. It has more than one phase, I think. Hey no. guys, uh, sorry to jump in it's here. Radiating, uh, inductive reactions, sorry to jump. capacitive reactions, all kinds of radiations. You know. Sorry to jump in here. Um, I have uh, Thomas uh, waiting in backstage. I'd like to get him on here to get uh, you know tell talk with him for a few minutes. Um, can one of you jump off and just stay backstage, and then uh, we can play you guys on after? I'll, I'll step Mike, up you'll step out. Whoever, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll step out. Oh, Mike, you step out. Know. You're already in. Oh, okay. All right. I'm going to add Thomas. Hey, Thomas. Welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi. I actually uh, jumped Hi. over here more to, to listen to it because it's I'm getting better quality over here than off of YouTube. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, just uh, we haven't spoken before. Welcome to the show. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what stuff you're working on? Uh, I don't know the, the about myself stuff, but uh, I'm working on what I'd call replicator level. 3D printer upgrades. Hmm. Oh, nice. like uh, one of the more recent ones that I uh, have uh, done the experimental stage work on is uh, using a 405 nanometer laser at 500 milliwatts. I, I can basically take rust and reduce it back to iron without any kind of uh, oxygen removal process, leaving the raw iron deposited on whatever surface it's laying on. Uh, Interesting. Cool. The intent is to basically go both directions, though. Be able to ablate things and then whisk them away and using uh, uh, electrostatic uh, energy and the speed that it's moving, the weight and the ratio and all, and uh, charging with different uh, frequencies of lasers to take whatever comes off of the ablation and s separate it out. So that way it can then be reused to print something else out of it. Right. So, so, you're, doing, so you're doing something like uh, nano... Uh, scale manipulation of matter. Hmm. I'll have to look into that. Um, a lot of it, though, is, uh, you know, uh, based on uh, instead of, like, grabbing the material and putting it where you want it, you flood the area, but you don't give it enough energy to bond except where you want it to bond, so it's then attracted to where you want it to go. That way you don't have to right. know where it's at, because it was one of the first things I heard people complaining about was... Uh, you can't really know where an atom's at because it's always in motion. It's like, why would you need to know? You know where you're, uh, like you, with photons, you know exactly where you're putting them. And right. you know by the frequency what they're going to do whenever they hit whatever it is. And something a lot of people, I guess, don't get is that when you get a reflection, the frequency of light that mm -hmm. reflects is actually stealing energy from that part when it bounces off it. So it uh, does the inverse of absorbing the energy from another frequency. That way you can take so, two overlapping and basically nullify each other. So, right. So, how would you cancel out that reflection? Well, that's the thing. I don't want to do that. I want to use that like a, a donut of reflected reflective uh, frequency around a, a a dot of absorptive. So that way, the center of the the donut, whatever size you make that, is all that's getting charged. Everything else is being decharged. That way you can get down to a single atom sized deposition without uh, having to have frequencies of UV uh, that, you know, will basically destroy or X-ray that will basically destroy whatever they're hitting. 
So right. So are you are you just doing this basically in your garage, so to speak, or are you doing this at a university or? No, no, it's it is some backyard stuff. So, so oh, in fact, I've got a whole. Best. I, I got lucky and turned a quarter of a bitcoin into six bitcoin, and before. I spent a bunch of it trying to help somebody maintain their place uh, while they were on a medical leave. Uh, I went and bought a bunch of equipment to get ready for it. So I went from like the amount of stuff that I need versus the amount of stuff I, uh, or the amount of stuff I need versus the amount of stuff I have to, you know, much, much closer. So I still have some more stuff, but most of it I'm going to build myself like uh, using a uh, nanopore or mesopore, uh, line uh the alumina that's been lined with like carbon nanotube material to grow my own uh laser diodes that are you know i can hit any frequency pretty much i want i just have to have a system to vacuum it all out so that way those higher frequencies will not be absorbed by the the gas that's in between it and the surface so so hmm. have you been, experienced I've... any transmutation of elements no no. no, I figure that's probably something that needs to be, somebody needs to work on that when I get the replicator 1.0 and I start mm -hmm. mass producing those and sending them out to people. People can figure that out then and that way we don't have to worry about do you have enough of this or do you have enough of that? But in the meantime, mm -hmm. you're still going to have like a pretty decent uh, period where basically we'll go from those who have these will no longer be resting on a fiat based uh, capitalism and go to an actual physical based capitalism that can't be manipulated. So, you know, you need some gold and you got a whole bunch of carbon you processed, you can trade that versus the, you know, more rare gold to print something out that you need to print. But when we can do something like what you're talking about, which this type of equipment would be the thing that you'd be able to, if it's possible, that would be how you'd be able to build that equipment to get precise mm -hmm. control. So right. that you could take a whole bunch of hydrogen or a single hydrogen and like a mercury atom and, you know, combine them together to get whatever you want, splitting others apart and neutralizing them, too. So that way, basically, they're not uh, unstable, and, you know, continually degrade, releasing radiation and falling apart, like uh, the way they were discovering that uh, the sprites off of lightning bolts right. neutralize radiation in the atmosphere. Yeah. So, so you basically right. build, yeah. build one thing shoulders from charged clusters. Thing. So, so you're Sorry. building like whatever atom you want from other atoms without releasing its harmful effects. You're just building, right. you know, from starting from something small to something bigger, something bigger. Oh. Right. Yeah. Take take whatever's okay. common. That way, basically, you don't have to worry about whether you have enough material of the right type on hand. I The whole point of this thing is a childhood dream. Thanks to Star Trek, because that was the first thing I saw was that if you don't have this technology, you can't really do deep space flight. Because when you get busy going somewhere, you can't just pull over halfway to Alpha Centauri to run to Walmart because something broke. Right. You know? Right. You need a manufacturing yep. center or process yeah. somehow. Right. So and they have uh, they have a three D printer on the ISS right now. So if they need like a plastic wrench or whatever, they could print it there and use it. You know. So they right. have experimented hmm. with three D printers in space. So. Hmm. Right. Yeah, that's well, I had, like, that's I the had... thing too is I've I've used the the same laser technology to take titanium dioxide white powder, and right. break it down to turn it back into that brownish black material that forms from crystallized titanium dioxide. So an electro right. uh, an electrostatic field on it to attract the oxygen off it, since the titanium has way more weight than the uh, oxygen, will allow right. printing solid titanium. So that means you can just take rust and uh, titanium dioxide and mix it and get an iron titanium alloy that you can print with like anywhere from uh, 500 milliwatts to so, two and a half watts worth of laser power. <laughs> so you can uh, you can actually produce some pretty exotic metal alloys with this. Right. So, and or not, not, not just not just exotic metal, metal alloys, but you can uh, get uh, wetting between substances that normally you don't see happening where like they'd have to uh, revert to using or, you know, to basically they'd have to start with something like indium to get it to wet on say uh, glass to get a metal surface that you can then bond on the indium, which then you're relying on the weak, the strength of the indium, which is not very strong. But if you can bond titanium metal straight to glass, you have a much right. better uh, material 
when it comes to uh, you know abrasion resistance and, and uh, flaking and whatnot it's not going to happen so so i mean there's a lot of different things it, with the uh electrostatic fields you could probably grow quasi crystals any way you want to you just have to keep shifting the the frequency to whatever you're wanting i typed something in earlier that apparently didn't show up because youtube is still censoring me <laughs> uh high yeah voltage. i wonder why well yeah i was gonna say high voltage you notice like if you have high enough voltage you can send hundreds of watts of power across a tiny little line and get almost no losses yeah. yep and i was thinking about that and i was uh, always always of the the mindset that basically super cooling materials means that you're it's like the equivalent of taking uh what is that uh it's not rosenberg what what's the the, the cradle is it newton's cradle the balls on the strings oh yes yes okay okay right if you take imagine if you take those and you have them disjointed so instead of them running in a line they're running more like this and you drop one on the end how much of that energy will make it to the other end and how much will be excreted out of the sides from them trying to go sideways a lot of that energy is going to come off to the side it's not going to make it to the other end and that's what a lot of our atoms are doing whenever you're trying to shove electricity through a uh, wire higher voltage uh, though if you've got a coating on it that coating is a dielectric they yep, call right. it an insulator but it is a dielectric and it absorbs electron field energy which means that if you have high voltage you now have a high static pressure charge it's squeezing those atoms to keep them from moving around yep. anyway but allowing that electron to shoot straight through so it may be possible yeah. just to wrap a wire with a uh, an insulator and then a conductor and an insulator and a conductor and then two insulators on the outside just apply a really high voltage to it like mylar uh, a millimeter thick layer that can handle up to 440,000 volts before it allows uh, discharge through it then you can run 12 volts through it and it should come through just as easily even all across a long distance on a little tiny wire you should still be able to get all that power out the other end without losing hardly any of it <laughs> wow instead of cool is a brilliant analogy Right, instead of cooling it down to get it to stop wiggling around, just put pressure on it to freeze it in place, like we do with a you know a pump, but we're using an electrostatic pump instead of using. So, right. so, so hold on, can can you take can you take the stuff that you're breaking down and use it like a paste between layers, and then hit it with static electricity charge and get it to form together or sandwich together and stay there. So, like you'd be creating three different layers. And it would stay as a solid layer once the material hardens in the center. You might be able to. I, I don't know. I all of the stuff I'm working on is working uh, when it comes to manufacturing is working on layers where you just build the layers up. But to keep it clean, uh, an electrostatic field is being placed on it while there's a laser running through the area, so that way any air that tries to get in will get buffeted away by the electrofat electrostatic charge. So you you only have like maybe a quarter of a millimeter of distance between the print head. And what you're printing on but you're keeping all that gas from getting in there so you've got a pure like complete vacuum in between the two so right hmm. nice interesting that way that way you don't get any contamination so if you're building those layers up you, you can just build that middle layer that you're wanting and then you drop the material on the next layer above it and uh, hmm. just bond it right to it you it, you're excre excreting the uh Whatever the contaminant is that allows the material to be worked with, that's being pulled back up through the build plate or through the electrostatic uh, plate to separate it from the rest of the area. So, hmm. interesting. that's interesting. I wonder if electromagnetic confinement would help you at all. It's like you said, compressing, right? I don't know. Just a thought. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, the the important thing is like uh, on the uh, the conductivity is just keeping them not only from moving around but also keeping them all in the same alignment mm -hmm. right on, on what you were talking about earlier by the way that whole temporal thing something yep. that i worked on uh, a bit before and actually to get to that point where you can even do uh, uh spatial displacement you have to figure out what that frequency is that the entire universe is oscillating at Mm. And it's somewhere in that static field that we consider noise, but it's going to be really hard to detect. Like we're going to have to go, th we're going to have to go through and detect all the other things and separate them out. And when we find that frequency that you just can't detect it, 
it's probably somewhere within one of those frequencies. Is that what, um, hey. is that what Floyd Anything? Sweet's uh, vacuum troid amplifier was doing when it was tuning into the ether? It was. It was I don't know. This is all stuff I've just the thought of on my own. I don't. I don't know who any of these other people are. Do so. you, do you uh, think it, it's, it, uh, this is all stuff that most of it comes from dreams? Like uh, I pretty much. Wow. Pretty sure what uh, Tesla was doing, and no one got a chance to see it. Uh, you're familiar with an electroscope, it, what it, what it is. Yep. Okay. Put a separate plate inside there, a third plate to go with those foils that has the wire instead of running to your input, it's running to a ground. So that when the foils expand, one of them will touch that uh, ground out, releasing that power, causing them to collapse back down. So you get a right. pulse of power running through it, and then it starts expanding in as the voltage builds, and it pops again. This keeps the voltage uh, level that's up in the atmosphere from being at ground zero by constantly being touching to, to ground. Because if you put an antenna up in the air and you ground it out on the ground, your uh, zero level is going to go across the surface of the earth and then up over where that uh, antenna is right. at and then back down. It's not going to gain any right. voltage from being up there. But if that's disconnected so that it has to fill that, that foil up to make that ground, that allows that voltage to go up in that area and then collapse. Ugh. With the pulsing, yeah, what he was doing in, in a dream that I had, it was causing that voltage to draw power out of the atmosphere from it pulsing up and down in voltage. So, and you, you, you well, I mean, it, what ahead. I saw was he, he had two electroscopes set up and he had uh, his, on his transformers, he had three coils. There were two primaries and one secondary. And the two right, primaries yes. wrapped in inverse. <laughs> so that way, basically, when it went out of the first electroscope and through the coil and dumped into the second electroscope, it would then return back through the secondary coil going the opposite direction before it went to final ground. So you got a, a positive and a negative shift on the AC wave that it was generating from that static field. And then you just do whatever he wanted with it from that point. And then he could transmit that information that I mean, that uh, that, you know, the energy. I mean, that is information, even if it's not, uh, you know, intelligible information, if it's just a general constant like wave, kind of like the carrier wave uh, of uh, FM waves, you know. So, and then it's you can so just cool. capture it anywhere. Well, so, I can it's... confirm the uh, antenna power situation because with my coil, if uh, I run a line up a pole and put a, uh, a toroid, um, aluminum toroid at the top, and I take the end of the secondary and I ground it, my primary becomes a pickup coil and the voltages I get are insane. I, I'm actually just about to do an experiment on video for that. I have a, um, an old barn that has to be torn down and a pole that goes up 30 feet. And I'm going to run line between the barn and the pole insulated from both. And then I'm going to tap it in the center and run it through my coil like an antenna, like what you're talking about. So because there's a primary and a secondary, my secondary will act as as the um, antenna, at least the input of the secondary. And the output of the secondary will go to ground. And then my primary becomes like a, like a step-down transformer. At least that's the idea. So Are, are, you, build, are you building your coil, your coil system the way... Uh the the warden cliff tower plans were designed with the two uh primaries because there's like three coils in that and one of them is like a step stage where it's it's more like having like one and a half coils so you have the primary coil that's uh, yeah. having an effect on the secondary coil and then that gets pumped right. into that long coil that yep. comes off it right. whereas the other ones were like uh the uh they were kind of like the like the su successor to the pelotron so they were just meant to be a voltage step-up mechanism that you could then dump directly onto that instead of using some other uh, generic form of like uh, electrostatic generation from a mechanical process. Instead, you could use that to charge your bu your, your electron buckets in a Pelotron to do uh, whatever it is that they were wanting to do, whether it was like, you know, uh, atomic acceleration or whatever. So I'm using a uh, uh, geometrical formed open core uh, electromagnetic coils so they collect energy there it's like 1500 feet of copper it's 750 feet wound 
one way and then 750 feet wound 180 degrees out of phase. So it allows me to collect more energy than it, at least it seems more energy than I'm putting in. But my third coil for, for what you were referencing is uh, part of the pickup coil system I have on the outside. So there's 12 coils on the outside that are 120 wraps each, they're ferrite cores, and I pick up energy from those. So that's- Are you presenting your thing tomorrow? I'm, I'm trying to, I'm almost done. I'm so close. I'm, I'm, I'm because I had to add something to it. I had another breakthrough, so I had to add something else to the paper, and that's why I wasn't ready for tonight. Otherwise, I'd be doing a presentation now. But yeah, my God, man, leave something for the history books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, you're good. I'm just really excited to see your your presentation. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm hoping to get this experiment into the presentation, but. We'll see because the place I have to do it at is an hour and a half out of town. It's well, I, the place to do the experiment. I, I'll tell you this: do the experiment another time. Let's just get what you have now. And well, you know, that's we've been waiting two months. Yeah, that's you not what working with. What was that? You guys are working with all that high voltage. Have you used any of this to uh, make your own uh, electrodes? Uh, I might actually inadvertently be making an electric right now because my coil when i put it in uh epoxy resin had no bubbles but after uh resonating it and doing experiments with it i have multiple spheres inside this thing that look like they're coming See, out of that's the that's what i've been asking everyone that i have talked to that's made electrics has used heat yeah, I don't to use... get the the uh, atoms in whatever the material is, it is to more, be more fluid, so the electrostatic field can then alter the way they're formed to form the the negative and positive uh, triboelectric charge on the surface. But yeah. no one has used something that's in a more solvent-like state. I mean, that's still a chemical reaction going on, but it, it's, is. it should still work. If that works, then it should still work with like uh, xylene and styro styrofoam dissolved in it as a, a paint, and then put that field on it while it's uh, while the xylene is evaporating from it, which is a really good uh, material to work with something like that because it dries so slow, it leaves a glass smooth surface on both sides of whatever it is you're, yep. uh, whatever, whatever you're, you've dissolved in it. So in fact, they use it as a slower so that whenever you're spraying something and you want it to be glossy, it's got more xylene. The stuff that's matte finished has less uh, xylene because that allows it to dry faster right. so it comes out rougher. Right. So the smoother the surface, that means that you're, uh, negative or positive triboelectric field is going to be lined up perfectly along the surface of that smooth surface to be able to, you know, control its shape. So interesting. I just I wonder about that because you're talking about collection. And if you have a positively charged uh, electrostatic field from all the atoms sticking out of that, that side that are buffering up against the thing that you're pulling all that electron uh, field energy from the atmosphere, it'll have a stronger draw. Yep. You, you could literally draw down below the zero uh, uh, voltage field in the atmosphere at that point. Yeah. Before, well, before it pops. Yeah. My coil does get, I guess you could say zero field. My coil gets really cold if, if I'm pulling large loads out of it and the, the loads are resistive loads. That, so, yeah, that, that's, that's very interesting. That's the, the thing that I'm working on for my yeah. energy source for all this equipment is based on uh, triboelectric inverse materials with a small gap between them yep. and a coating of uh, a neutral material like uh, graphene or a, a, <clears throat> I call it lead fiend, basically a sheet of a single atomic layer of uh, lead, something that basically has that four electron field so that it's, it can receive or uh, give up electrons. That way it won't wow. interfere with that, that triboelectric effect that's underneath it. Yeah. So that when they, the air bouncing back and forth between the two of the of them, when it hits the positive okay. one, it's going to give away its uh, electrons to it. When it hits a negative one, it's going to pick up electrons off it and then back again. That way it builds up a field and that conductor will pull that energy off of it. The, that, so it's, like that a dielectric, uh, it's like a dielectric capacitor, right? An electric? Almost, almost, except that you've got free, free ranging uh, uh, gas moving back and forth in it. So as long as it's still warm, it's generating power. The more power you pull from this thing, though, the colder it will get. 
because you're literally right. converting thermal energy into electric energy, not allowing a thermal energy to move through it, but rather you're just literally nullifying the, the thermal energy well, because it's being stored away as an electrical potential. So Yeah, it's going to be a big discovery when they finally figure it out because uh, apparently you can't turn thermal Heat, uh, uh, right. Your energy. Into you're you're you're, you're right. touching on the entropy thing. This is reversing entropy. Yeah. Well, I use it's, entropy. It's part of it, the system. I use. Well, yeah. Yeah. That that's that's yeah. the whole point of the black hole. The black hole is the entropy, uh, yeah. ultimate entropy system that basically breaks matter back down, and that's where the, all this dark matter, the, the the effect that they consider dark matter is coming from. It's deactivated matter. As soon as it gets well, activated again, right. it'll recombine into hydrogen again, and right. we start all over again. I had so, mentioned right. this with uh, Nathan on a live a few days ago when uh, I was running my system at, I think it was 24 volts or 28, I can't remember. Um, I just decided to, to see what would happen, and I took my lighter and I put it in the center of the open core, and my voltage changed on my pickup coils. So, and that's just a that plasma in between there. What's that? Plasma, throwing that plasma in there between the uh, the gap with the flame. That that flame is nothing more than plasma. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but you shouldn't be able to pick that up, though, no. <clears throat> well, because then it's you, isn't it, it, isn't it, isn't it like atoms shouldn't be able to quantum entangle either. But you know, if you take a magnet wheel with a bunch of magnets stuck to it on a really good bearing set. And you put another magnet wheel on the other side of the room, also on a good bearing set, and you start spinning one of them. The other one will spin, even though there's no physical connection between the two of them. Just because they're they're magnetically connected. Yeah. There's the, the reason why you get these weird, like, uh, spooky action at a distance. Because they're mm -hmm. less affected. They've got a better bearing system than any metal bearing you can put together or any other type of bearing that we can build in that, in that magnet wheel. Because they're literally free-floating in space. Yep. Right. Just whizzing around, right. interlocking with each other. <laughs> so yep. zero resistance. Yep. So as close to it as you can get. I mean, you're gonna have the resistance from the effect of each other and their right. fields, but we're talking field interference, not physical like grinding interference. So that's yeah. uh, coils don't heat up at all. I can make them heat up. I know how, but when I'm running them, they don't. I, heat's not an issue. In fact, my issue is is I'm blowing um, horizontal deflection transistors that are good for 1,600 volts because I'm creating too much. Hmm. So, yeah. Working on some things. It's interesting where I'm getting. <laughs> so you, you need higher voltage uh, transistors? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I may not need transistors at all in the near future <clears throat> i was gonna say uh you might if i get the when i get done with the testing if i get some positive results i'll shoot you some info on uh, how to make your own transistors using a uh, starlight that might help so i don't cool. know you, you guys you guys know what starlight is uh you talking about the material starlight yeah yeah i have a good idea if i'm right so it's, think 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 this way remove whatever ideas you had of how it was made before okay. and instead use your your activator because okay. they use baking soda in the generic ones yeah modify change that to something else as your activator so that you have two different batches of material that one had whenever it forms has a positive dopant the other one has a negative dopant paint the two on top of each other heat them up so they exfoliate turning back into that pure carbon which is a semiconductor but with those dopants in it, like one side has phosphorus in it, the other side has boron in it. You now have a. a, a, a I never diode. thought of that. But well, this is the thing, though. That's a uh, a form of carbon-based aerogel. So imagine how good that is at thermal resistance while being very good at conducting electricity. And that's that what makes a good peltier. A good peltier is a a, a diode junction that. Thermal energy will not travel easily through, but the electricity can freely throw, flow through. That could so, have some profound implications if put into the right system. That could, could be a secret to making a, a much more efficient and easy to make at home based solar cells, too. Yep. That instead of them getting hotter, they actually get colder while the sun's hitting them. Interesting. The more power you, you allow them to, to generate. 
as long as you, you close the circuit, pull the power off, they start pumping that heat out and evacuate it into the atmosphere, getting colder. Definitely in that data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing I haven't tried, I'd like to try, is put my coil uh, in front of a solar panel at night just to see if it picks up energy. I don't know. I don't know if it would. Because it's photons, right, that we're dealing with when you're talking about solar panels. And when it comes to this coil system. Well, hold on, hold on. This is my theory on that, though. Photons in a vacuum, the, the actual physical particle, mm -hmm. is just the speed. The, the reason it moves at the speed that it's moving at is because that's the speed it requires for electrons to be uh, evaporated from whatever they're in. So there's not an ultimate speed for it. That just happens to be the speed that it happens at. And we don't have a way of accelerating beyond that. Just like there's a speed that you require to escape the body of, of liquid, the bonding that goes on beyond the bay, between the hydrogen and oxygen and water that you have to accelerate until you reach that point in order to create steam. That's and that an point interesting is, way of looking at it. So, so wow. I mean, if that's, if that's true, you could prove it by basically using your own electron emissions directly instead of using light you're hitting it with electrons the, the, the oh, important thing is I the want amount to of potential. right now no? <laughs> yeah you just need the right amount of potential so that way you don't overcharge the solar cell because that's why some light doesn't work because it overcharges it so it causes a, uh, a bridging action where the energy yeah. the the solar cell just short circuits itself i i found that uh just putting a piece of lexan polycarbonate in yep. front of a uh, right. uh solar cell actually increases your wattage oh, i really? tested the amperage coming off it and the voltage the voltage will drop a little bit but the wattage the amperage comes up high enough it makes up more than the the, the losses in voltage and now that wasn't even the reason i was doing that i was just wanted to see if since uv doesn't do any good at uh, generating power in a solar cell i want to see if i could block that since it turns into heat and yep. maybe it's even affecting the solar cell the way it, uh, uv affects a photo you leave it sitting out in the sun what happens it yeah, actually it's fades. Yellow and, yeah it fades well, and it fades right so if you can inter, inter, uh, interfere with that destructive measure while letting the rest of the light through your solar cells should last a lot longer that's interesting you but it looks like it may that. actually be by blocking out the unnecessary frequencies of light you stop them from <laughs> counteracting the energy that's created by the the necessary frequencies so I haven't had a chance okay, to do it yet, but at some point, you guys, you guys have uh, seen uh, polarizers where you use a quarter wave and half wave rectifier. Yeah, that way you can get instead of it just turning black and clear, it actually creates color yeah. effect. Yeah, that's right. that's it, that system can actually hit a single nanometer of light. You can really? actually tune that so that you can actually pick a, a nanometer, a, a specific nanometer frequency of light, and that's the only one that's coming through it, like 97%, while only about 3% of all the other frequencies are getting through. That could hmm. come in handy. Yeah. <laughs> so you can build a great big one of those things and put it in front of, like, you know, a mirror and then have that go down through, like, a a, a lens. To go on to so yeah, a filter work was a filter right they're right. filtering the solar <laughs> right i thought about using that with the uh, water because it's i'm sure there's probably two frequencies of light that water reacts to and everything else is basically just noise it interferes with it so if you can get those two frequencies hitting that that container of water that you're electrolyzing it'll reduce the amount of power that of electricity you actually need to put into it to break the water apart because it's already charged by those two frequencies Right, so. and your structure, oh. and you structure water, like sunlight. UV actually structures water, mm. right? So uh, we that, have a, yeah, a viewer in chat asking, uh, "Do you have any videos or anything that you can show us?" Uh, I think the only thing I've got right now is uh, one of those uh, color polarizer units. I did a couple of those where I basically was just rotating them around, but they're on a, a different. Uh, YouTube channel. Uh, let me see here. Thomas, you've been on APEC. Yeah, anything you can pull up would be great. Yeah, if I have. Not, well, we'll save it for another yeah. stream. That's where I remember yeah. meeting you. Yeah, you were in, on APEC a few times. Let's see. Here. Let's 
Let's see. So let's not all talk at once. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to kill the mood or anything. No, no, you didn't. Yeah, no, no. did. Check this out. You guys seen this book before? Oh, this is actually one that I've got that's probably useful, too. You guys are talking about the magnets. Uh, and you were talking about epoxy. I crushed yep. some neodymium magnets, peeled all the, the chrome off it, right? Just put it on a steel uh, anvil and then took a hammer and just tapped it to break it up into, into powder. Mixed the powder into epoxy and then in a Ziploc bag and then I laid that Ziploc bag on a magnet. Mm. And I actually ended up with a magnet that had a magnetic field only on one side. Oh, really? Huh. Wow. My, my guess is, is because when you look at it from the side, you can see it's solid black material on one side. But as you get closer <laughs> to the other side, it turns into these thorns or spikes coming off it. The way like ferrofluid forms. Yeah. So my guess is because it's oriented properly that the magnetic field is coming out the sides until you get to the very tip of that. And that's creating magnetic uh, destruction on that side. Like you could put it any any direction at all on something and it would flip over to the other side. If you had it on the side that had that no magnetic that's field, cool. it would keep flipping over to try to stick to the other side on a piece of steel. And, uh, wow. you know, I mean, the, the whole point was to try to find a way to take all these magnets that are the wrong shape and make them the right shape. Yeah. They're not very strong, though, so we need to come up with a way to basically create that electrical connection that happens in the crystal structure whenever it's formed to have, you know, an amplification of, like, the magnetic field, or I should say an amplification of the magnetic field collapse, because that's right. the, the other thing I found. I thought magnet, uh, the higher the end, the longer the reach would be for the magnets, but it's actually not. Uh, okay, so, so the you reach have to complement the field geometry to the crystal. Right. Well, so. you got me thinking here, and this is a question for everybody. So if I was to, say, take uh, a long iron rod and heat it to the point of, like, almost liquid, or, or for that matter, pour a new rod and have my coil surrounding it, and I was to pulse it, if you were to get the domains going all one direction, that creates a magnet, correct? And just a magnet? I don't think it'll create the domains going the same direction. I think what you're going to get, like you see whenever uh, metal cools, is instead of it being disorganized, you're going to see the domains constantly flipping back and forth. But they're all, uh, the ends will be f facing either toward one end or the other. And that's where your magnetic field, I know, comes from with the uh, iron. Uh, like a neodymium magnet is not made of neodymium. It's made of no. iron. And then it's doped with neodymium and boron. And it's yep. two, two uh, neodymium and one boron to every 14 iron atoms, which oh, wow. coincidentally form a very specific iron crystalline shape. So what you're getting is a, a, a reflector in the middle and two ma uh, magnetic uh, lenses on the ends in that those uh, paramagnetic material of the, uh, the, the neodymium. So that it can basically take all that energy that's coming from those 14 uh, atoms that are linked up like that and concentrate it coming out of both ends instead of it just being, you know, willy nilly. So it ends up interfering with the other crystals adjacent to them. So well, I've still been trying to get some people to try the same thing. At some point, I'll probably have to do it myself of just like, um, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with soldering with uh, other materials other than, you know, just your tin lead and uh antimony and whatnot but Silver. bismuth you can use bismuth just like regular tin you just throw down the raw and core uh, flux on it and then heat the uh, surface up and drop the the uh, the bismuth down on there and it'll melt and bond right to the steel really so <laughs> that's kind of the thing is to to build a stack where i've got 14 times the amount of uh, material that's in the bismuth layer of iron on either side of it and then cap it off on both ends with the uh, aluminum foil that doesn't have any coating on the aluminum or take the uh, coat the surface by uh, friction spin well uh, welding where you just take a, a rod of aluminum and press down on it while it's spinning fast and just paint it with aluminum metal because it'll bond right to the surface as soon as it knocks the oxygen from between the iron and the aluminum uh, honda was the one that uh, patented that because they were trying to weld like uh, aluminum rods to their steel cases for their motors and that was the best weld they could come up with was just taking the rod spin it up fast and push it down on it 
while holding it still and then turn it off and unchuck and let the aluminum rod go and it would be bonded right to it. Wow. I'll have to so, remember that. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So I don't know what all metals it will work like that. It's kind of like a uh, cold welding where like, if yep. you have no oxygen on something and you take two pieces of metal and touch them, they bond right together, but hmm. you're forcing the oxygen away instead of using a vacuum. So it means you're going to have some waste, but Hey, I mean, it's a lot less waste than, uh, you know, going the other route. So trying to yeah, use some sort awesome. of like mechanical and like get, you know, gas arc uh, welding and stuff like that with all the sputter and whatnot. This doesn't even heat the material up and distort it either. In fact, that's what they're using to put all their rockets together. The casings, they roll it up. So the edges are up against there. And then they take a, a, a rough, uh, like an auger and run through there and it just grinds the material up as it's moving down through there so that it meshes together to form one solid piece. So there's only the heat of the friction is what's generated by it. So that way there's no crystal deformation or anything like that. That way when it gets hot or cold, it doesn't cause it to pop and break and fall apart. Uh, that's how so. they make perfect welds. Yeah, <laughs> Tori Tor doesn't want anybody to know because that's like a big secret for their rocket making. But that's yep. basically all it is. I mean, Honda already spilt the beans on it. They just never tell anybody they're using that same technology. <laughs> wow. We have people in my chat like screaming, you got, you need to write a book. <laughs> uh, all this stuff has already been done, though. I mean, that's the thing with yep. my 3D uh, ma manufacturing upgrades. They're already being used somewhere in the industry on like a industrial level. That's why I have the confidence I have that bringing them together will work as well as it will because they're already being used elsewhere and extremely right. effective. So right. I, I, it's sure. just nobody's taking the time to put the piece together. And you got a lot of lack of crosstalk whenever it comes to industry uh, scientists because you got to keep their trade secrets, you know? Yep. So. NDAs, NDAs, NDAs. Right. When this is the thing, what I'm planning on putting out is going to break the back of the corporate structure because you won't need a big, like, you know, 50,000 square foot facility to print out a cell phone. You'll be able to do it on a desktop and use an old uh, piece of uh, pieces of old broken cell phones to feed the machine to make them. Hmm. Nice. So it, yeah, you got a lot of fans over oh here, my man. God, this is like <laughs> really Speaking cool. of printers. Nathan, I'm going to get that printer you told me about for a hundred bucks and uh, I'm going to call you on that. Get you to give me a hand running it. Absolutely. <laughs> if you yeah. want some really uh, tough parts, look up uh, Tallman 230. There's no printer on the market that uses filament that can't use the stuff. It's uh, right around the, the temperature range of ABS, but it's nylon and polycarbonate. There's mm. like, a, they, I don't know if they have something else in it or if it's a specific uh, type of nylon, but it melts at like 230 degrees. So it'll melt just as easily as PLA or ABS, but the stuff is incredibly tough. I replaced parts in a shark vacuum that had broken on one of the, on the, uh, uh, the rollers. Oh the yeah. Brush. I know exactly what you're talking about. I broke, ran a broke, well, I broke one. Sort of I mean, they, they broke one from, you know, cat and dog hair and all the other stuff. The little round stuff. things with the little square on the end. Yeah. The, yeah. I, I yeah. printed one of those up, popped it in there and outlasted the other one. Wow, I'm surprised. So I made another like, one, put it on oh, the other end. As, as far as I know, it was still working whenever I, I left there, and it, that was like five years of use, and it broke. The first one broke in like a year and a half. Hmm. I got it. Just printer. that that Tallman 230, and I mean, I make stuff every now and then, even just using a 3D printer pen. A printer pen. So, if you can get the hot ends, you can get the really good stuff because it's got quite a bit more stiffness to it. Uh, the the Tallman 910. That's it's it's almost as stiff as polycarbonate, but it's as it's also got the unbreakability that the nylon has from it, them blending the two together. So <laughs> I don't know if anyone else is using the the blend or not, but not yet. Mike, but I, Mike, I think there. Mike wants to come on. Uh, let me step out because he want, might want to. I, I can Thomas. step out. He's got a lot. No, no, put, no. Put, he Mike, wants put to me in the background so I can listen, but. No, no, Mike wants to talk to you. So I think I should oh. step out and then Mike should step back in. <laughs> should, right. should I be worried? <laughs> I want to talk to you <laughs> outside. <laughs> no, no. All right. Mike's fun. All right. So 
So have you guys ever heard of the book Order Out of Chaos? No. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Man's new dialogue. Yeah, I've heard of it. I just got it. It's an old book. Well, older. It's on uh there's uh quite a few parts on gravity in here, so I'm gonna read it and get back to you. It was recommended through Jeremy Reese. Yeah. Yeah. Thought I'd bring it up as we were waiting for Mike. So <laughs> yeah, say my uncle Mike's had here. some strange thoughts on gravity. He uh for an anti-gravity rocket propulsion system and generator, he was saying that a rod of mica, copper caps for the, the field generation, and then drop two rings on it that you could charge negative and positive creates a propulsion. Uh, I experimented with the sheet design for the gravity field generator, that, which is mica and copper, but as an antenna on walkie-talkies. And we were able to get some insane distances off of like one of those sets of the realistic, like. Uh, Radio Shack with the little yellow button. Right. Yep. Gray, yep. gray yep. walkie talkie and nine volt battery. Yep. We had a constant communication. It was actually clearer than across the street whenever a friend of mine went over vacation from Tulsa, Oklahoma to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Wow. So I don't know if that's because we were using another type of energy source or if it was just because I accidentally made a, a fractal array antenna because we were making the copper part, etching it by just painting this stuff on by hand as teenagers so <laughs> they were they might were not that great looking <laughs> might have been both might be right. so interesting something to play around with i mean I'm, I'm not even sure what type of minerals are even in the the mica that you buy it, it was just those uh, windows for furnaces that we were using so yeah, yeah who knows what well, it is well they say mica capacitors are probably some of the best hmm I don't even know if they even make mica capacitors anymore. They do. They're the, the ceramic, no? Yeah. Uh, no, ceramics different. No. Well, so, some of them are some of uh, some of the ceramic capacitors have mica in between the two uh, uh, okay. conductive plates. So it just it just depends okay. on what you're getting. I I'd always heard that that uh, like you know people talk about glass and uh, Teflon and all this other stuff. I didn't realize that uh, there's more than one component to your dielectric constant. So you've got like uh, not only the uh, resistance to uh, barrier breaking, but you also have uh, that, that just comes from the ordering of the material, but also you can generate a, a barrier resistance by absorption, which is what they found with the, the uh, what is it? The CCTO, it's uh, copper calcium titanate. So like your dial like your constant on like the high end of the spectrum with like Teflon like a seven, but then this stuff has got a dielectric constant that goes way off that scale at like anywhere from a hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, so, Jeremiah Hop was talking about that recently. Yeah, yeah. That, in fact, that's where I first uh, heard about it, and I had to go do a lot of digging and research. I've got most of the materials. I still have to make some uh, uh, copper oxide for the mix to make the, the uh, ceramic clay yeah. to, to fire some up. But I told him I was going to make some because we were going to see if we could make some uh, asymmetric uh, capacitors, so nice. some spherical ones. Nice. So hopefully we can use a better wetting method so we don't have to use indium for, uh, you know, the, the conductor to bond to that ceramic material when it's done. So Indium's a little pricey. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's not as durable, though, either. I mean, there's better materials. Uh, when it comes to you know the other traits that they have besides the wetting aspect, so if you can, we can get those other things to wet to it, like getting copper to bond directly to it, or using silver, or mm -hmm. even better, use uh, thorium dope silver, you know. Yeah, if you so. can get your hands on it. Mike, <laughs> uh, if you want to put, Mike, if you want to put your diagram up there, we can. Uh, yeah, you know what? Shoot. Before you do it's that, I hate to say this, but I have to bail. I got the stink eye. Yeah. And some things I got to do. Before tomorrow yeah, morning. we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be signing off soon. We're just gonna show Mike's uh, circuit there, and then uh, we'll call it a night. All right. Well, it was good talking to you, Thomas. Hopefully, you'll come back on again. I'm sure we can have some deep conversation. Actually, I'd like to get your. Uh, you, you got a YouTube channel? I do. It's WPG Enlightened Four Truth Two. <laughs> These guys are giving me the link. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I still remember it. 
it's kind of a weird name, but it is what it is. Yeah. I was going to say, the, uh, the other channel that I was going to pull that from is Morph Trust, and nobody gets gets that either. So, yeah. So it's meant to be like morph, like Amorpheus and Trust, oh, yeah, because okay. I set That's it up it. separately as like over, a trusted over, over. secret. But what you really want to uh, do is you want to go as fast as What was it? The uh, email account. And it's then I ended up making the YouTube channel off of that. Simple fact. <laughs> Want to put a nice. lot of this radiant All right. Well, it was good talking to you. Uh, get the uh, link off of them. My emails on my channel, and uh, it was good talking to you guys all. Thanks for bringing me on, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, you, Gerald. Good job. Thanks, Gerald. Yeah. Have a good Thank night. You. See Hello, you again. Gerald. You're in the background there, so <laughs> we'll talk to you yeah. guys all real, real soon. Hey, Thanks. before you go to anything else, yeah. the the guy running this show, the Faraday yeah. Research. Have you, yep. uh, you were doing some stuff with uh, ultrasonic, right? Yes. For yeah, energy the, uh, transducer. Okay. Yeah, have you tried uh, taking anything like aluminum metal and dropping it in a, uh, a non-oxidizing uh, organic sol uh, solvent and uh, hitting it with the ultrasonic to break that, uh, that aluminum down into like nanoparticles? I've never tried that. I, I, the last time I, I had a chance to try that, I got one of those little three liter units, the 40, right. what is it, 40 kilohertz they run at or something like that. It's not like right. super right. high frequency, but Just, yeah, still, yeah, the ultrasonic but cleaners. The, the stuff turns blue as, it, as oh. the aluminum is breaking down in it. So my thought was, so, you know, it's got a lot it? more explosive power. So if you can make it deoxidize like that, you could add it to things that like uh, you need more punch more oxid oxidizing punch like rocket fuel and whatnot it'd probably make a much more powerful rocket fuel but the oh. stuff you're working on i don't know what all you could do with that i mean that'd be oh you just gave me a really 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 good idea i'm making uh crystal power cells like quantum magnetics and he uses certain materials in it and there's a lot of oxides that create the reaction to make electricity that might be something interesting that I might want to try. Yeah, I saw a long time ago somebody was making crystal cells and so you used the power would drop cleaner. way down, but then they just keep making power for years afterwards. Yeah, and I was looking at what right. he was doing. I'm like, you you were using uh, this guy was using like uh, water glass as part of it. And I don't know if yeah, you I'm using realize my... this, but the power you generate will actually extract the sodium from it, leaving quartz crystal material behind which is piezoelectric that's right and that's what i have in my cell so now any vibration so, is generating power even just sitting there the the thermal energy and yep. it making the little atoms jiggle around or generating electricity off yep. of that that's so that's exactly what it's doing yep like the so cell i, guess I just the, made yeah. here actually i have one running right now i'll show you and uh I'm predicting that this cell here should last five to six years. Uh, let me change my camera here. Does it swell as, as time goes yeah, on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I use a special material in there when the crystal, it's, it can expand. I use silicon carbide. And what will happen when it starts extracting energy, it will expand up to 300 times. Oh so God! I use so that's why that's why your cell's going to stop working. Eventually, it's going to break that glass. <laughs> we got to well, figure out a I, way I, to I, basically I, limit the amount of swelling so well, it gets exactly the right amount, but not go beyond it. And then yeah. it'll probably last forever. You know, there won't yeah. be a life. Well, I'm not, uh, well, there's no glass, no physical glass in it. So hold on, let me. Did Mike, you can you turn off the screen share real quick? We can't see your. Oh yeah. Your, can you oh, turn that off? Oh right. There you yeah. go. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, so here's the light I have running right now. Right, right. And I got, and I got four cells. They're all running in series. All right. That's good. I noticed that some of those uh, crystal cells, if you tried to uh, run them in series, you didn't get any more voltage out of them. Being yeah, able to get that, uh, that extra uh, voltage is definitely a well, major like I, over... Well, I can right now each cell is putting out about 1.6 volts, and oh, each wow. cell is putting out well over 500 milliamps. 
That wow. is strange why so, the voltage doesn't uh, go up in series. That's not normal. Yeah, there's something very, very anomalous it's happening. More like a, it's more like a current cell, not so much a voltage cell. Right. Well, it, it, the, the most power that I actually got out of the cell was about 2.18 volts at about one and a half amps. It's multiplying so, the, the current wow. with, uh, with the series link, not the voltage. And, and you know, the voltage is multiplying. If you put them in series, I can get as much voltage as I want. Oh, I thought you said it was. I just keep. No, it does. It well, no, there, that, I was the one who was saying there's a that was one a, a major hurdle to overcome because uh, a lot of other people yes. I saw doing that they couldn't get that to work. That like the voltage yeah. coming out yeah. of one would actually nullify the voltage on the next one or something. Right. So and I got two plates. They, 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 they add typically in the series. So I'm not going to say exactly what I have in the middle, but I have two two graphite plates side by side. One is altered slightly to create a differential of resistance between the uh, from the other plate. So the anode is going to have a slight increase in resistance than the cathode. All right. I use a, a polyethylene glycol dry. Uh, it's basically a dry cell. There's, uh, and then after that, I have a jelly substance that I put in there and I mix a whole bunch of elements in that jelly. And one of them is the silica. So when silica gets charged, it expands up to 300 times. So if you don't have that jelly substance in there, it could actually destroy the cell, It'll actually crack the graphite. Right, right. So when it does expand, it expands in the jelly. So well, what kind of graphite is, are you using? Are you using like a graph foil, uh, like the flexible stuff, or are you I'm, using solid block graphite no, cut flat plates? Yeah, yeah. I'm using well these ones here. I'm using uh, a graphite ingot, so it's rock hard. Okay. Oh, wow. Now the now the new cell. These ones are small. They're only about an inch and a half wide by three inches long. My new one is twelve by twelve inches. So, so, say, uh, we, so we were able to, we did a test, just a simple galvanic test with uh, basically uh, magnesium, um, a salt water on a rag, and then have the two graphite plates together. We were getting 1.7 volts at about 17 amps. Wow. So you make gains on the square inches of space so the bigger the cell in size the higher current you're going to get so these cells here they're putting about 1.5 to 2 amps the 12 inch cell i'm expecting a lot more so very, very impressive interesting work. cell hmm. so i i got the uh, i'm actually the new graphite i I've replaced it with pure graphite and it's going to be laminated on an acrylic sheet. And I'm going to have two of them, two 12-inch plates. And then I built my mix on the inside. So we're getting some pretty interesting. I had one of my test cells ran for almost four months, no problem. And where you think it would die off, it just keeps pumping. It's, it, the energy is coming from somewhere. And, Still, I really, honestly don't. My, my guess is it's not a chemical story. reaction. You're you're getting an electron exchange because of the imbalance you've got that's coming from that that right. thermal vibration. The only way you're going to stop that power is to drop that to absolute zero. If there's any right. thermal energy around, it's going to generate more power. Right. So if I put my hand on those cells, just the heat from my hand, the power goes up. Yep. There you go. Just don't so overheat it. <laughs> no, no, just to heat of my hand, you know, a couple degrees right. hot, you know, hotter than what it is. You know, the power goes up, it climbs. Hmm. So cool. it's the, like a supercharged the, solar right. panel. <laughs> kind of, but it doesn't actually need physical light to work. It's, right. I right. think it's, yeah. I think what's happening is there's quantum tunneling happening between yeah. the two plates where there really isn't 
a galvanic action happening at all. Somehow the the electrons or the ions are traveling from plate wow. to plate by a means of a you know a quantum force involved. That's why they call it quantum tunneling. It finds its way. That's exactly it's what a, 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 a viewer just chatted in. Should have almost no galvanic action. So he's spot on on that. <laughs> spot on. Well, I'm Asia. wondering if you can uh, nullify the oxidizing potential that you see. I've I've already figured in, it in, out. In oxidized cells using citric acid or something else like that. That's a uh, no. or not citric, but the ascorbic acid. Something that's an oxidizing like, scavenger, uh, but it's not powerful yeah. enough to stop the oxidizing from happening. It just undoes it every time it right. happens. Well, what? Or just build the, a, there's, a vacuum uh, there's actually chamber for every cell you make. Well, no, there's two substances that I found out will actually uh, greatly uh, retard the oxidation process. So instead of my cell lasting, if it didn't have any protection, it lasts maybe two years. Well, now I can probably double it now. Nice. I might nice. lose some of the. I might. I might lose some of the current. But if each cell is putting out, say, half an amp, and I got eighteen cells in series. Well, guess what? I got a lot of amperage behind it now, and the voltage to boot. Let's so see. Now I can pulse adding it. adding that to the uh, lithium-based cells that I made to figure out how they're making uh, rechargeable cells. Took the the cells before I added that. If you fully discharge them, it ruins them. To you can fully discharge them, and it doesn't ruin them. You can still charge them right back up. See, I don't know how how much charge... extra life it gives it, but if it does, I mean. <laughs> One thing I do know with these cells, if you do put a charge, an exterior charge on it, you will destroy it. Right. So as soon as you make it, it's on and it has no off switch. Right. That's it. It's on. So mm -hmm. these ones here, these should last four to four to six years. Because I found the element that protects and slows down the oxidation process of one of the elements that I use in my device. Um, yeah, it's out there. The information's out there. I took this idea from a guy named Michael Kantz. He ran a uh, YouTube channel called Quantum Magnetics, and he made uh, uh, silicate carbide uh, power cells. He was working on it for probably 30 years. Unfortunately, he passed away in he passed away in 2022. He actually had a provisional patent on that cell. I can't find the patent. It's gone. I don't think it went through. So what information that he actually did provide on that cell, I've been decrypting what he's been saying and actually trying to back engineer what he has done. A lot of stuff don't get through nowadays. Yeah, and there, there's so, stuff that is getting yeah, through too. You, you've got people that are getting patents for over unity devices now, and it used to be that anything that claimed to be over unity or a perpetual motion immediately was yeah. kicked to the side, and then you'd have to go through a long, long uh, court. It don't matter if you patent it or not; it's not going to get through. So, patented or open source, nobody's going to get it. Yeah. Well, this is why I said so, a lot of these people who are trying to push these things through. I think honestly, the smarter way, if you really want to make it uh, make a difference. Use it to give yourself an advantage on some business that you're running. You know, I have a well, thermal diode make a system. difference if it's as simple yeah. as putting a square in a square hole. Okay, and well, well and, and that's that's what the thermal diode is. The thermal diode basically okay. pulls heat out of a chamber and pumps it out into the out open atmosphere, and it literally is nothing more than getting the distance between thermal blankets the right distance and facing all of them with the metalized side facing the same direction that you want the heat to move. Because it, you get, uh, the, I don't know if you realize this. Or didn't, Polarizing the heat. I didn't realize why it was working the way it was until I, I found this out recently, like within the last five years. The air around you, if you're at sea level, is still 99.9% .9 vacuum. Only one thousandth of the, the volume around you is actually some sort of solid gas particle moving around. And it's moving around at, surprise, surprise. The average speed is the speed of sound. That's right. why sound travels the speed it does, right? So that means that right. you've got a lot of vacuum between those two that the only way for the energy to travel from one side to the other without a gas particle picking up heat and then touching something and discharging it 
is to turn into infrared radiation. A mylar blanket is a dual layer material that one side absorbs 100% of the IR and it reflects 100% of the IR, which means that once uh, it travels out of that, if it's trying to come back as IR, it just keeps getting kicked back to the other side until eventually it radiates out the other side. I took a three, a $400 a month electric bill from the AC during the summer by just covering six windows and dropped it to $100 a month. I did some wow. testing on the window with just four layers of this material up there with a little bit of air gap in between each layer. And the backside of that material was at 65 degrees and nothing in the house could drop below 67 degrees from the air conditioner. This was inside of a box that the mm -hmm. bottom half was open. The sun was coming straight in and hitting the uh, curtain that was behind it that it was encapsulated inside the windowsill. And that heat was rising. It was right. still sucking that heat out so fast it was keeping that window at 65 degrees. I mean, that's one of those things that, like, people are going to be like, oh, there's no way that can it can be as great as that. Because, you know, if something sounds like it, uh, too good then it, it, to be true, then it probably is. Doesn't right? Tungsten, tungsten so, will transmit uh, better. It'll, you know, transmit electricity better the hotter it gets. Yeah. So, uh, I'm not sure about the, the tungsten metal. I'm pretty no, sure no. tungsten carbide will, though, because... Uh, Semiconductors, oh, a lot of them. Yeah, the semiconductors. The hotter they get, the better the, the current they they carry. The one in which the is why uh, LEDs like the you have to restrain them or they burn up. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, yeah, yeah. When it hits black black body ra radiation levels, uh, probably it's not the tungsten that's carrying the power more easily. It's the fact that you're generating plasma around it. If there's any argon in there, you think so? And that that plasma is going to be more conductive than any metal. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So. Right. So maybe the wow. tungsten has bit... something to do with creating the plasma. Right. Well, I was gonna say there's there's you know there's a duality there. Like I said, metals usually, the more power you push through them, the hotter they get, the more resistance right. they build. Whereas right. semiconductors, which are crystals, the more power you shove through them, the easier the power flows through. Which, if you have too much voltage on it, will allow so much current to jam through there, it'll burn the uh, semi-crystal semiconductor crystal up. So you have to protect so it from that... itself. So if I'm putting, say, the heat from my hand on my cell and actually increases the voltage, I guess the heat differential is actually assisting the ionic flow from uh, anode to cathode. That, that could be part of it, that, other than it converting the heat from your hand into electricity. Right. It's actually absorbing oh. it and actually making it into a heat sort, uh, power source. Right. That's, that, that's, that's the test. That. You need to build one that can handle pumping out a ton of energy. Like it can, you can siphon that energy from it and then right. test it to see if it gets colder from the, the more power you draw from it. If it starts getting colder, then that means you are converting thermal energy directly. You're reversing entropy to turn it into an ordered uh, energy source from a disordered or so, chaotic energy source. So would that be a violation of the second law of thermodynamics? I'm trying to remember which one that is. That's not well, the one where basically you can't get more energy out of something than you put into it, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, no, no. You're, that's, that uh, stops you from violating that because it's turning the energy that you're putting into it that normally is not expected to be able to be turned into energy, electrical energy, but you found a way to turn that energy into uh, a power source. Yeah. So the same thing with magnets. If you... Uh, yeah get a magnet cold enough it'll eventually stop exhibiting a magnetic field because there's no electron flow it's right. literally an electromagnet but thermal energy is being turned into an electrical flow charge through the crystal that right. creates a magnetic field so so the magnetic yeah, field is not coming from nowhere <laughs> well wait wait that, so that's basically that's saying that uh, you know large bodies that are sub-zero have no magnetic field it, they're abs absolute zero not a few degrees above so, or so a fraction of a degree, but like actually them. absolute zero. That's the thing. If you drop to absolute zero, though, you're not going to be able to detect the thing anymore because it won't interact with anything around it without the right, right. amount uh, and mm -hmm. form of energy injected into it to re-energize right. it back from that dark right, matter right, state right, back right. into uh, and, and, and active we don't matter have, state. We don't have, and we don't have any instruments that actually could pick something like that up. But yet the body, not. the large body that is hypothetically at sub-zero or absolute it does exist even though we can't detect it right that, that, that's why i've been saying like the black hole thing if you look at it you got all this thermal energy coming off it so, so because a, such a body can exist without heat 
well, you're you're compressing everything to where it's excre excre excreting the uh, heat from it before it gets dropped into that that core. When it hits that core, it's now at absolute zero, so it can't interact with the gravitational field of the the black hole, and it will just drift out without affecting anything around it. And we're not right, seeing right. any of this because we can't detect it. But That's when it gets re-energized, those no particles, electrons. right? Those particles will so eventually get. Well, those particles are less than electrons. They they will recombine into the electrons and protons necessary to make hydrogen all over again. With something sub oh, here's uh, absolute zero actually stuck in available energy because it's not moving it would attract it would no you're, you're looking at yeah you're looking at something that won't interact with the things around it for the most part so that's why i said i don't know what i don't know I, obviously it can't be a 100 there has to be something that can energize them because we got matter that's popping up all the time like in the cashmere effect so that material is probably dark matter that has gotten the right amount of the or the, the the energy has been able to make contact with it maybe most of it just passes through because it's not moving and something has to hit it directly to get absorbed so that it can oh, then reactivate it with enough energy. But Thomas, um, with my, uh, my crystal battery cell, when I dead short it with an amp meter, the amps don't lose, they stay high. It, it, it's not losing the, the current, it stays up. It doesn't what about move. the voltage though? The voltage will go down a little bit about half but the current increases okay yeah so it's reacting like it's supposed to then it, it's following all those those laws but i i still think probably the majority of your energy you're pulling from it if it's lasting that long is that thermal energy it's not the material it's made out of breaking down it's literally converting that thermal vibration energy into electrical right. current by swapping electrons around it's probably because yeah, it's partially be acting like a, a very very sensitive diode so yeah uh, yeah power, one, uh, one, one way diode yeah one direction diode yeah ha have you looked into uh the laser blading for uh, making uh, uh graphene foam out of things like paper and uh cap and tape and whatnot right yeah yeah i've seen that i was gonna say uh they if you if you look you'll see there's some where they're saying like when they go back over with a lower power right it actually causes the material to start forming into these spikes which they're they eventually they stop forming because they run out of carbon to work with but you could probably add uh more you know carbon to the atmosphere with like some pro well i don't know if you'd want to use propane but like maybe uh, vaporized wax or something like that uh even carbon dioxide should still work though because it'll deoxidize if you're using a uv laser instead of the uh the blue laser they're using to deposit right. on that so you could grow short uh, nanotube structures off of your your uh, graphene foam your carbon foam structure that you're wanting for one of those sides that might increase your uh, at least your amperage versus Ooh. the amount of thickness well, of the material like yeah. increase the yeah. the energy density is what i'm looking, looking at yeah, like the, the current is there. Like I'm getting well over one amp with each cell. Wow. So I got four cells. I got four amps. So say I put a light on it that requires 300 milliamps at 12 volts. It's running that light at 300 milliamps. It will only draw what it needs to run that light. Now, if I dead short it, the amps go through the roof. Right. Hmm. So. Yeah, the the, so, uh, the nano nanotube structure just basically is like taking the material that you're working with and crumpling it up so it'll act like a much bigger surface area cell. So it seems like it's pumping. So when you draw a current on it, it expands, right? Right. And when the expansion happens, that happens in the jelly mm -hmm. substance in the cell, so that prevents it from fracturing. And then when the current is released off it. Or the, the load, then it contracts back, regages, and then it could do it again. The dead short so, doesn't wait. call for any resistance. That's why your amps go through the roof. Yeah, it goes through the roof. Yeah, it just, you know, spikes yeah. like crazy. Use the like coil with some kind of impedance that would, would, would be good, different. Well, the, the, the proper way that Michael Kahn said you have to use the cell is it would be like in press and pulses. So it would be uh, two seconds on seven seconds off two seconds on seven seconds off so 
my ultimate goal is I'm going to make a four kilowatt generator system using these cells to regenerate my batteries. So I can have a four kilowatt system running all the time while the crystal power cells regenerate the batteries 24 7 seven days a week that's my goal so, depending on how expensive they are they, since a house doesn't move well, you literally line them up in your basement and start powering your house yes. off of them. <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> and yes. they, that's what i'm talking so, about now why why power your house why not power a shop where you've got some sort of business that now you're not paying for your electricity whereas well, joe blow down the street doing the same it, thing he's still paying the electric company with it. Okay. and you can basically no, use no. that pump back into your other projects oh. you know no what you do is you hook it up to all your gpus and start mining bitcoin for free <laughs> how about that how about that there's even idea. better if it's actually turning that thermal energy into electricity so that means it can siphon that heat out of that environment even mm -hmm. if you got to throw it away yep. on the roof running a fan you or something got it. you know you it's got it flywheel. I put so. I, no you put this you put the cells right beside the gpu the gpu heat Heats up my uh, crystal cell and puts out more power. Thank you very yep. much. Right, 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 right. right. Well, right. don't don't get yeah. GPUs unless you're doing something that requires GPUs. Well, get ASICs because they're way more ASICs? efficient. You you'll generate okay. money much much faster. <laughs> With the A okay, the ASICs, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. But I was just kind of making a point. You know, the energy yeah. and the heat created by those you know uh, computer systems that could fuel my power cells and increase the uh, potential of the cell. Sounds like yep. these cells can also so, cool things so down. Gonna, well, yep. I gotta do some experiments with that. I got a thermal laser, so I can yeah. uh, let's find do out some experiments with that. So I'm curious. Very, I, so, I know the uh, Trumbull electric week, system does that, but I don't know exactly how that's working. Like the the Trumbull electric system requires a um, a vacuum layer between the two with right. the gas particles moving back and right. forth, whereas the I have like that. They right. just be well, using my, that, uh, that jelly like liquid to, to do its bouncing back and forth. I'm using a solid state polyethylene glycol as my dielectric in the middle, and it works fantastic. It actually has electric properties to it. So hmm. it's holding a charge. Hmm. So Have you looked at the oil that it. comes in uh, uh, the old Isn't CRT like video bird? projectors? There's like a, an oil inside the, the uh, right in front of the lens, in between the lens and the, the little screen because of running so hot. I'm using a sodium silicate and that works really good. Um, that's one compound and uh, the gel, the special electrolyte gel that I'm using. Now, I'm, I've got a bunch for... of it. I've been digging to see what people have, have done with it. So, because I, I can't find any information on how the stuff's made. I just know that it doesn't change any of its properties even from getting like up to 300 degrees whereas most oils yeah, it's break probably down so it probably be almost kind of like uh uh, uh the coolant that you use in the car probably similar because it has a very very high boiling point right so it's probably an ethylene glycol type substance in it hmm i don't know I, i'll have to do some more do some more digging. Yeah, that's the. I mean, it's that's not easy to come by. So. Oh they, yeah, because those, the, those projectors they don't, they don't are disappearing now. Yeah, they, they don't make that's them anymore. Right. So everything's DLP. So that's part of the yeah. the, the replicator tech. I moved from uh, the concept of using LCD uh, arrays to uh, to uh, shine the the laser light through so that it can be turned into a pattern to using DLP tech. So that way you can literally awesome. control an entire path of area instead of it just being a dot like right now uh, 3d printers with the fuse filament just one dot and it has that dot has to make its way to every single area that that plastic's got to be yeah. same thing with the laser whenever you're doing a laser centering even uh, <coughs> but you know with that system you just shrink that down then after you get it run it through the the dlp and now you can actually right. control a whole patterned array in one tiny little spot and hit the whole area once i've got a concept too for the the filament where it right uses on. like a slit and instead of the whole slit being open for the plastic to flow through you have square pins that drop down in there and then you can right. retract whichever pins you want to make the uh the, the the line any pattern you want while the head rotates around to basically it if it's uh if it's possible 
to get enough heat for that whole thing and whatnot for like a thousand pin width uh, array. We'll be looking right. at being able to print something that takes three hours to print. It'll print in 30 minutes. Wow. I'm ready to go. Anyways, I mean, not 30 minutes, uh, sorry, 30, 30 seconds, you know. <laughs> yeah, so. that's amazing. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, we're going to end the show. We've been on two hours and 35 minutes. So I'm pretty tired. I've been up since early, early this morning. So, Nathan, Ben, Mike. Uh, oh, so, Lulu, so me that guy's uh, uh, channel URL, the one that was on earlier. Oh, uh, oh, Gerald's. Okay, hold on one sec. Just bear with me for a minute, and uh, we'll call it a night. Um, oh, my internet's starting to crap out on me here. We only got 38 comments on YouTube. Is that what Holy that's saying? Up there <laughs> well, the live I'm chat. I'm put mine in chat, chat as well. So I wonder how many people are being censored so whatever they're typing isn't coming through either. Yeah, my internet's been kind of funky tonight. Yeah, I used to I get censored too. When you, when you use words like, you know, S-H-I-T and stuff like that, the algorithm starts watching you. Yeah. What you type. Yeah. There's a lot more that it seems to watch for too. That seems way more innocuous. So I've been noticing that. Hold on here. I'm having troubles with my. I wonder how that's the the Google breakup is going to affect all that, because they're getting ready to be uh, monopoly busted. So. Yeah, the Google thing with the uh, privacy. Uh... Gerald's email. I'll say that that a, privacy thing probably isn't going to matter now. I, you saw that thing where over what is it like two point four billion people's uh, social security numbers and whatnot had been leaked somehow. <laughs> okay, in the, in the private chat, I just posted mm -hmm. Gerald's email, so you can uh, get a hold of Gerald that way. It's in the private okay, chat. You'll see the tab where it says private chat. All right, guys, thanks. Uh, this was a great show, awesome show. Please come on again. Uh, you're a wealth of knowledge. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to be doing some, uh, I'll have to do them on Rumble, but I'm going to be doing some like presentation things as soon as I get everything sorted. Not only whiteboard everything so people can understand what I'm actually doing, but also the yeah, physical so finish after, up and then after, testing so they can see that it works. Because I'm really wanting yeah, people to after, take advantage of like, that thermal diode tech. What what's your Rumble account? Do you have a name on it? Uh, Morph Trust, same as the the one that I put in there. Uh, what is it? The yeah, uh, YouTube.com slash uh, at Morph Trust. If you use that same name on Rumble, it, that's my primary channel, and everything else is umbrella uh, underneath yeah, that. Uh, you could also put it in the uh, comments after the show, and then people can yeah. go back to the comments. That, and see maybe that, that won't there. get censored. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All the way to find out is to refresh the page and look and see if it's there. I like I got to where I started opening. Anytime I was watching a live chat, a, a live stream on YouTube, I'd open two instances and put one on each of my screens on my computer, so I'd know if something's getting through. Because it's not getting through, you know, what's the point in uh, trying to co communicate with somebody whenever they've been deafened by someone yeah. in between? Yeah, you know? you could, yeah, so. it's, it's good. Yeah, to that's a pretty common contrast. exploit. You can actually do that to increase your views a little bit. Put a, a view on each window. <laughs> Tell your viewers yeah. to do the same, and then just increase it. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing right, guys, something like that on of... Twitch, but not intentionally. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, guys. Later, guys. Uh, thanks, okay. everybody. Thanks, thanks, a lot, for guys. Having thanks so, Nathan, Mike, yeah. Mike. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.